live hello welcome to molten chat here this evening just going to check that you can hear us you can hear me you can hear gaz we've got gaz over here this side mm -hmm. who's with me yes. this evening for your entertainment uh -huh. and notification so yes. please yes please do let us know in the chat that you can hear us and then we'll crack on until that point we'll just sort of babble for a little bit until someone can tell us that you can hear us and see us and uh, then we'll get on with it Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's warm then out, isn't it, at the moment? It's very I'm warm. Quite, quite warm in here. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Anybody out there? Okay. Yes, okay. Clear, guys, clear. You can hear us both. Good. Okay. Right. Well, we're, we're just going to crack on as if that's all going to work then. Excellent. So, here we are. <laughs> this is uh, this is Molten Chat. I'm Robin Vincent. And my guest this evening is Mr. Gaz Williams, who is. I have no idea how to describe you really. An, a, an internet <laughs> personality, a gearhead, a musician, yep. a, a, a yeah. thinker of thoughts, um, a deeper mm -hmm. of dives, and uh, a <laughs> newbie in the world of Eurorack, yes. which is kind Absolutely. of part of the focus of what we're talking about this evening. But first of all, Gaz, oh, do tell us how you are. I am. I'm okay. Yes, I'm okay. It's uh, you know, like like all of us, all of this this weird, strange era is. Uh, it's certainly, God, I mean, you know, one good thing I think about this whole pandemic business is that no matter where you are from, what your race, religion, what country, what your background is, we've all, we're all in this thing together and we've got this kind mm. of shared experience. So when you meet people in the future, you know, instead of just like talking about the weather and then just kind of, <laughs> you've got something you can actually talk about like the world can all talk about this shared experience so i think um you know that's, that's really interesting are you do you live in wales yeah. are you in I, wales don't. I live in bristol i'm from wales oh. i moved to bristol in the mid 2000s uh, yes because i was going to um, see bristol. whether you had you know completely different rules in wales you know maybe you're you're all allowed out or maybe you're all locked down i don't know but as you don't no. i'll bypass no. that question Hmm. Oh, my audio is out of sync. Am I? What is that? Is that? Uh, am I in front or behind? Well, not oh, yeah, for me. For me, you're okay. you're fabulous, but um. Oh. Hmm. Almost. Okay. Ah. I don't know. <laughs> I can't fix okay. it from here. I don't think there's anything I can do if I, particularly. If, I, if you don't actually see my mouth, if I cover my mouth a little bit with my hand there, then. <laughs> Well, we should be mask wearers. That's what we should do. That's right. Yeah. Although masks are... I need to get a really massive one, though, to get all this. Oh, you've probably got a similar problem, haven't you? Yeah, Although, it's a thing. You know, well, that and glasses. It's, 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 all this oh, extra so, bulk at the time. Somebody else says it's in sync, so we're not going to worry about it. Let's not worry about technical issues. We're just going to we're just gonna get, get on with the, with the loveliness. So, um, <sighs> well, the first time mm. I met you, Gaz, was last year. Mm -hmm. No, yes. No, I think it was at Toman, wasn't it? Yes, I might have run into well, you previously, but not in any kind of introductory sense. But uh, last Tommy year, was the bonding, wasn't it? It was not just yeah. of us, of, of a whole bunch of us. <laughs> but, sorry, carry on. Yeah, yeah. So that was the first time uh, we met, I think, and that was a fascinating experience. <laughs> Lots of different well, people, different vibes. Yes, and when we were at the airport going back, we were so engrossed in our conversation, <laughs> I missed my flight. I, know. I still can't work that out and i know you'll never drop it but it was it's quite we fascinating stood, we were stood at the gate yes we were at the we, gate we were at the gate and apparently they said that that they'd called my name twice yeah, we yeah. were just because we've just been at synth uh synth reactor for the past week or so having this incredible time and, yes. and we were just like we, ah, having a fantastic conversation and uh <laughs> Yeah, they called my name twice. Uh, so yeah, no, I still can't mm. work it out. And I've been through the same bit since, and I've stood there going, "Now we were standing here, and your gate yeah. was only over there. And how did we?" You know, I mean, I, I knew yeah. that I was the only adult that, there at the time, and I was supposed to be looking after you, and yet, yes. you know, pff, I don't know, we completely <laughs> blew it. But I was all right. But this, so that's nice. <laughs> but this does tap into the thing, doesn't it? About when you start talking about synthesizers, music technology, mm. and and those kind of subjects, it's the infinite conversation, isn't it? There is it no is. end to it. There's so much to talk about. So you can go yeah. anywhere. I mean, particularly if people of of our sort of 
vintage, I suppose, because we have, I mean, I don't know about you necessarily, but I have previous lives of stuff and technology yeah. and right. you know times when I was working with this stuff that no longer exists. And then there's this stuff. You know. <laughs> I so know. you can keep Kids going back. Kids today don't know how lucky they are. I mean, <laughs> hard recording in 1995, 1996 was nightmare. You'd spend like 20 minutes recording and then the next three weeks editing out all the glitches, you know. Oh, God, you know. So it's like it's because of us and all the kind of groundwork we did, you yeah. know, kids can just swan about on their skateboards making tracks on their phones, you know. Yes, they can. Yes, they can. No, I mean, I remember yeah. in the late late 90s was my uh, shop floor turnkey time. And mm. uh, in like that time, I had to do things like try to strike Simpty to, uh, to Cubase, you know, try to get variable yeah. sample rates out of a computer that couldn't run audio to save its life and try to sync that up with bits of tape and then ADAT was like all over the place and then you're trying to get software synths to work you know two seconds after pressing a button and you know you really had what's to work then? hard in those days you did um but what's this society of motion picture and television engineers what's that from simply oh yeah yeah um Baby it's a Zaffa song. He sings a uh, simply society of. <laughs> oh, is okay. it really? Well, there you um, go. Yeah, um, yeah simply. Yeah. But, but actually, you mentioned Turnkey. Yeah. My goodness, for for many of you won't know what Turnkey is, but that was like kind of the shop that sold the music tech, and uh, you know it was um, in North, well, West London, and it when you'd go in there, like kind of peak the peak era of kind of things like it was crazy it was like you couldn't move in there mm. it really was not it? it was like it was just such a popular thing i've never seen i've never seen anything like it oh, never, it was completely before, nuts no yeah. i mean although i mean walking around tome and you do go all oh, right so this is how you do a multi-level massive music shop oh, properly i yes. suppose with space <laughs> yeah but we were stuffed yeah. into a little corner shop on Charing Cross mm. Road, where you just mm -hmm. packed, packed people, well, you oh. packed the salespeople in, packed the customers in, packed the boxes high, stack the boxes high, sell them cheap. <laughs> that was that was the idea, really terrifying place. Um, God, yeah, they had like everything that were behind like glass panels or, or, or like like you know at times just so you could you couldn't even get hands on. It seemed like there was just like a whole load of people being shepherded through the store, kind of, uh, or like those kind of those Japanese people who 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 squeeze people onto the onto the tube. You know, they're just uh, at lunch <laughs> yes. hour. Have you ever seen that? So yeah, really, yeah. It was like that. It was like that in there. Yeah, it's definitely the Saturday <laughs> experience. I, I mean, although Saturday, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, everything was. The plan was to have everything out on demo, but you had a lot of people stealing stuff. You know, there was people who would wear big overcoats and they would just gradually undo things that are on demo because everything was screwed in. And they would you know, go past, undo a couple of nuts and then go past it and they just sort of hook things inside and try to get past uh, Eli, who was the guy with the shotgun at the uh, at the door. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. Gosh. That's Times have times. changed, though, haven't they? Times have changed. I mean, yeah. blimey. It's you know, a Chipolati now, Chip, Chip, Chipotle. It's a Chipotle restaurant, unfortunately. That's what oh, Twinkie is now. I used to, uh, Sound on Sound, the venerable, the fantastic magazine, always had an insert, didn't it? Of, yes. of like Turnkey. It was like it was like a magazine in itself, which was just, and, oh man, I was really excitedly pour through that. I, I used to scour mm. that every month scour it i can't oh, you know God. <laughs> well in the days of paper when i started right we had a like a yeah. uh, a box file well a you know a, a lever arch file that was this thick which was your your price file and that had every product mm -hmm. every price and you'd go through that wow. with all the margins and stuff and when you're trying to build a quote with somebody who was buying for a studio or for their home oh he's gone yep. it's that bloody camera everyone Is who it? watches my show knows all about this yeah, it just kind of cuts off every 30 minutes, and it's just just really, really annoying. Um, hang on, let's go back there. I'm so sorry. Yes, everybody will go, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was saying, oh, yeah, paper. So, yeah, we had to find everything. We are on calculators, paper, handwritten, everything. All the invoices were handwritten. I'd write all the serial numbers down and stuff. Yeah, everything <laughs> just took an age. But you'd do it. You, you would... 
it's on the counter someone would be working and they walk in and they'd buy 20 grand's worth of studio equipment it would happen you know on a daily right. weekly basis just nuts wow but yeah. uh so what was your I... first since yeah, then let's jump into that so did you were Whoa. you into since previously or is yeah. it more recent thing no, absolutely, absolutely. I got my first synth in 1987. And no, actually, no, no, no. My first synth, I, I, I beg your pardon, was before that, was the Casio SK-1, the little little sampling keyboard. God, when did I have that? Probably about 80, whenever it came out, 83, 84, mm. maybe 85 not sure but uh, that was a groundbreaking little thing that little casio sk k1 i mean obviously become really famous as the, the almost as the the default circuit bending tool you know <laughs> you, you 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 kind of earn your chops circuit bending and a, a casio SK, sk1 um but that thing was fantastic uh but my first proper synth came not long after that and was um was uh, uh a hybrid system, as it's called, and uh, it was a Music 500, uh, Music 500, uh, which is like probably I would say it is f physically, visually the most boring synthesizer ever made. Ah. It, it it would attach to a BBC microcomputer via this um, kind of like a ribbon cable, uh, but the thing itself looked a bit like uh, like the old hard uh, the old um, floppy drives from the the day, but was a featureless box and it just had a din plug at the back so so you get audio out on a din plug didn't have any midi controls on and connected to the computer with this air ribbon controller uh but what it actually was was an eight voice fm synthesizer and Righty. on the bbc computer it was um it it had a it was a really early computer software sequencer vince clark out of Verasia, um famously used one on a lot of Eurasia stuff um maybe even no i think it, that came out about 84 maybe 84 85 I, I got it around 87 and um so i was kind of really early into sequencing and yeah. you know using a computer as a sequencer with this uh with this uh fm synth um and initially with the music 500 it was all you would sequence it like uh just like look like basic the language it looked just like lines of text it was it like a tracker was it a bit more tracker style oh no no it was it was like writing uh, you, you programmed it you right. were writing line lines of text programming it uh and then there was an upgrade which was called music 5000 and that brought a gui you know a graphic Ooh. interface that made it so much easier um so that so i experienced that when that came out uh, the difference was amazing but i'd kind of so my first kind of sequencing was you'd be writing lines of code but driving this fm synth uh so i started playing bass guitar in 1987 as well so both my synth time and my bass playing happened at the same time so those have been kind of concurrent things because uh i define myself mostly as a bass player and i've done a quality work as a bass player i've toured the world i've played with big artists i've had a, quite a good career over the last 20 years with bass you know mm -hmm. um, but some of those bigger gigs have been using bass guitar with a midi so um so it's a regular bass with MIDI. In fact, it's just be uh, just by there. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and that kind of, I think I was always looking to fuse those two worlds together. You know, because I've got a lot of dexterity in my fingers. I'm yeah. an absolutely dreadful keyboard player. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Those of you who've ever been at the trade shows and have seen me kind of go and try and play, it's like, oh no. <laughs> they kind of, <laughs> but but when it comes to bass, I mean, I've got I've got chops for days. You know, I can play all kinds of crazy fast and technical stuff on the bass. So I kind of um, I've always thought, why should the pianists have all the fun when it comes yeah. to this? You know, it's, no, absolutely. You know, I mean, yeah. I had a I had yeah. quite a quite a parallel 
a parallel experience in that at a similar time, I mean, I, I didn't buy any since my dad bought some things, but he bought a Technics KN200 in, in the early 80s, which was, you know, mm -hmm. it's a automatic keyboard type thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it has home, some really nice key. sounds on it. Yeah, home keyboard, that's mm. right. But then he bought a DX100 out of the blue, wow. um, which wow. was just brilliant. And I would sit, one of them would actually sit quite nicely on the top of the other. And I could I would play both at once, like a home organ kind of thing. And, you know, little bell sounds on the DX. And I'd play in church, of course. My dad would play a piano and I'd play the keyboards alongside. And that was our our little thing. But at the same time, I'd also just picked up guitar. So I was massively into to synthesizers as a kid and electronic music as a kid but then the the potential of leaving home was coming along and knowing i couldn't take this mm -hmm. gear with me so i thought well i better pick up another instrument and so i started you know learning guitar and trying the same thing trying to marry these two things together but the sequence that i had well the first one i had was this little slab of plastic from casio which only had a stop and record no play and record button on it that's it there was no Nothing else. It was just MIDI, so you would press record and start playing, and then it would play that back. But after that, I then had a Commodore 64 sequencer called oh, Electro yes. Music, I think it was. And mm. um, uh, I sort of, the pinnacle of that came when I did a gig uh, for my friends, you know. I think I was 18, so it would have been eight, 88 or 89. And it consisted of the the Commodore 64 sequencing a Roland E20, which was the next thing my dad had got, uh, which didn't have bad sounds, except the drums would always run automatically regardless of what you did. So I had that. I had a friend mm -hmm. on drums and I played guitar alongside. And it was phenomenal. I mean, it was rubbish, but it was phenomenal. And it took like three or four minutes to load each song. So between each song, I had to talk. <laughs> everybody <laughs> and make stuff up and then play really badly out of time with the the sequencer as it was going but you know i've always mm. been just massively ambitious uh mm. way beyond my ability to actually do anything but i think me too me too ambition to way, out, way outweighing talent <laughs> mm. yeah um wow interesting ah gosh so i mean there you know i've so did you ever try playing uh, midi guitar then um yes i kind of i mean I, I sort of flirted with it in fact uh when i ended up at university several years later i built a, a pitch to midi converter that was my final project uh, but it was actually wow. based around flutes because weirdly i spent the first two years of my degree i'd gone to do this degree in music technology to build synthesizers and i my first year i i made a, a baroque recorder you know a recorder and then in the second year i built a flute a rudel and rose flute it's beautiful because i suddenly found an interest in woodworking i had no idea that i had uh meanwhile all my other project you know all the other bits and pieces were electronics based but i had this practical bit that for some reason i just went headfirst into woodworking which was brilliant wow. i loved it but then for my final yeah. project i sort of brought it together by building a pitch to midi converter for the flute that i'd made and um and played an m1 and that was lovely <laughs> so yeah I, i've oh. always had that interest in in pitch to midi i've never really i've never really married it with the guitar funnily enough I've, I, that seems like too much like hard work do you know you mentioned the m1 1988 when the m1 was released uh, a friend of mine was uh well he, he he bought one i don't know how on earth he could have afforded it because it was about 1300 pounds back then which is probably equivalent to about three three or four grand now i guess but mm. uh no three grand maybe not sure um but the m1 oh my goodness we would go into the music shop um in wrexham in north wales uh uh raise underground music uh, and we'd go and we'd put the demo on which had the it had a like the tenor saxophone playing right. <laughs> We were going, you can't tell it. It sounds identical to a real sax. You cannot. <laughs> you can't. We, you know, our minds were blown. It was like, it's as though there's a saxophone player in the room with you. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I the love those big multi sounds, those big, you know, some kind of forest thing going on. You're just these big, yeah. everything playing oh, yeah. once. <laughs> just great. Uh, universe. The first patch on the on the M1, the first patch when you when I think it's a zero 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 or whatever, and it's that it's like it's like a kind of string patch, but it's got like a watery noise right. all behind. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. You know, I, I I think back about I think back about that that time when that came out and just how 
outstanding that experience was. And then, of course, mm. I think was it maybe two years later or a year and a half later, and the wave station came out and like hearing ski jam, and it's just like my goodness, the patch, you know, do you know that patch off the wave station ski jam? It's kind of, you know, it's, well, it's, it's, a, it's a very kind of classic wave station kind of vibe, you know, where you've got lots of little tiny, you know, the, the sound is made up of very small loops of all sorts of things. Yeah, um, so it chases itself about. I mean, yeah, I mean, which is, which interestingly though is, that was like, that I couldn't believe it. It was unbelievable. But, but how to actually go about making a sound like that? You could edit it, and there was quite a lot of depth of editing you could do, but you wouldn't really want to do it. Um, but um, when uh, now the um, wave states come out, mm. um, that whole thing, it, we haven't actually really gone back to that thing of, of lots of small waveforms all joined together. I mean, yes, we do with um, with wavetable stuff, but these are lo much longer. They Rather than wave, you know, these are much longer. Um, I don't know. Sort I guess like it is. like partials, that isn't it? It's like a bit like using yeah. partials on, our, like, on the yeah. digital Roland synths or something yeah. like that. Yeah, exactly. But a bunch of partials all along the time, you know, the timeline. Um, uh, but... Um, you know, just I think what I was just alluding to there by hearing like the M1 and then hearing the wave station. Uh, for me, I don't think digital ever quite got better than that in terms of the wow factor. I, I then, for me, the wow factor has always been like, you know, hearing an Oberheim or, you know, some beautiful analog mm. thing has always given me the wow factor as opposed to, a, you know, that digital kind of, ah. Oh, well, there was a, I mean, there was a period, I mean, certainly my, my turnkey experience, because I had to, I was the keyboard maintenance, no, the cleaning, keyboard cleaning guy would be more accurate. I had to make sure everything worked at the end of the, the day and in the following morning, that kind of thing. And so, but the synths from, I mean, I was there from 96 to, well, to 2000 on the shop floor. I then did other things later on. But during that time, it was, well, you had the, you had trinities i mean they're boring <laughs> i mean in terms of, of synthesizer legends uh we had the the trinity we had the jv 1080 2080 that kind of thing workstations mm -hmm. it was all workstations yeah. workstations you had yeah. a they had kawaii i suppose the k5000 um mm. but other than that it was really quite dull uh i mean a an1x maybe you know physical modeling the the core prophecy that was interesting but it, it, it hit this point where I don't think it quite knew what to do with itself anymore. You know, you've, you've got every sound you could possibly want in a Trinity yes. or in a Triton. Yeah. Um, software was still going, I don't know what I'm doing yet. And so it was in uh, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a strange space. You knew, no right. It was a, I think it was a lot to do with, though, things would come out. like So the M1, well, the D50, yeah. DX7, D50. M1. That's the lineage in the 90s of, oh, sorry, 80s of like of a particular thing. But once you got to the M1, which had the sequencer, the effects, mm. and the sound, it always it just became a thing of just more of everything. So more polyphony, more sounds, more you know. So so the 90s is kind of typified by these things trying to do more, more, more. You know, as opposed yeah. to trying to refine the interfaces or well i mean there was a bit of that going on but yeah. um but more i think and these are the you know this, this was the absolute dominant japanese era isn't it i mean yeah music technology was utterly dominated by japanese companies in the 90s i mean just to a ridiculous mm. level just on a little side note when i yeah. the first time i was in tokyo i went into one of the top music technology stores there i was just super keen to see what kind of interesting stuff was going on in japan that hadn't maybe made it out of japan yet and um went to this music technology store and it was all european or american companies you know the the the, the kind of rolands and the korgs and the um yamahas they were there you know um the type of store it was it, they were really focusing on kind of you know the kind of more cooler side of things as opposed to all of the um more utilitarian stuff mm. that those companies make plenty of but i was just looking around there i didn't see a single thing that i didn't know about which i was disappointed about i was hoping to be going oh god there's this japanese yeah, company yeah, you yeah. know 
Yamahatsu or whatever or something I've not even heard of. And, um, and I thought, wow, good grief. It just it really made me reflect on how the Japanese dominance of music technology just isn't there anymore. It's it's just uh, it's certainly in the kind of cutting edge area, mm. you know, that that yeah. was kind of from, you know, Electron and Native Instruments and Moog and Novation and Arturia, you yeah. know. No, so very much, very much. Mm. I mean, the I mean, they tried. I mean, Yamaha had some wind technology there, you know, the WL something or other. I now can't remember. Oh, yeah. And uh, there was the JD 800s. You know, there were little, oh, yeah. little bits. And yeah. then somebody's yeah. mentioned in the chat about things like microwaves and um, and Sonics. Uh, who else? XTs. Well, there was Access Virus. But again, we talked about European. That angle is yeah. coming in. And I, I don't think yeah. we realized at that point that what what we needed uh what i mean is we were we were nose diving straight into software software was putting us in with the promise that it could be everything you don't need any of this clunky hardware anymore which was brilliant uh, yeah. uh we thought and so we didn't yet quite understand why we liked hardware and we were we were blindly throwing ourselves into software having a wonderful time and so yeah. perhaps there wasn't the innovation there wasn't the heart in the hardware at that time because everyone was kind of moving away from it you know, I remember racks of samplers just disappearing yeah. and then suddenly we didn't sell samplers anymore. That right. just seems nuts. Yeah. But, you know. And also, though, it, it was a kind of era where DJ, um, you know, where a lot of things, start, a lot of manufacturers just started catering more to the DJ market as well, yeah. you know, and yeah. sort of there was lots of DJ well, and actually innovative stuff, but in, in much more aimed at the DJ. And there was a real division. I mean, that division still exists to a, a, to the you know to a degree between the, D, the you know the the DJ market and the sort of music tech market. It was like you know never the twain shall meet. You know <laughs> this line, you know, DJ over here and music tech and studio stuff over here. Um, because actually, something when you do look at products from the late 90s, for instance, one of the giveaways is um, phono phono sockets on them because music tech doesn't use phonos, mm. DJ culture does, but music tech, you know, what music tech stuff uses phonos, not a lot. You know, some mixing decks might have some, but that's mostly to accommodate tape decks or stuff, yeah. but you know, yeah. so yes. Just, just a little, just a little observation there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, we we ripped out the whole basement and turned that into a, a DJ department at about that time, ninety nine. I would say right. about nine two thousand. The loop Ooh. station. Um, yeah. It be yeah. It, it overtook everything. We were selling more twelve tens than anything else. I think for for a while. I, well, maybe yeah. maybe it was a, a race between the Quasimedi Revolution three hundred nine, the best groove mm. box ever ever born i think <laughs> and and 1210s they were the two things that are massively selling and i, I remember taking mm. a 309 home because we were allowed to to learn them and all of the people i lived with at the time were all very much rave heads and uh, i would just sort of like set it going and they'd just dance <laughs> it was like an auto dance machine you just put in a little bass line and just set it you know fall to the floor dum -de -dum, take the drums out put them back in yeah. great it's a party it's fantastic can't like It'd be like that though, trying to get out of the raves like back in the nineties and uh everyone would be still so kind of munted, chewing their faces off that like <laughs> as soon as a car alarm would go off, it would everyone would be on <laughs> to the car alarm. That's all you need is a car alarm and then some then then some people would start popping their horns. So and revving their engine, revving their engine, car alarm and, and the horns. <laughs> yeah. Those are yeah. the days. That's Sunday yeah. morning in Brixton, that is. Uh, well, right. You know. <laughs> oh, yeah, God. <laughs> that is a party. That is a party part of London, though. Um, yeah. So you mentioned roof boxes. Oh, yeah. And something I'm, I'm, something I'm doing, um, me and Nick Bat at Sonic State are, are doing a little oh, thing. Good segue, Look, man. I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but a, you, you'll, see what, you'll see why I'm linking this now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is... Roland MC707. It's been out for what, probably about a year now, is it? Maybe I'll get on for a year. Uh, has think? had a bunch of updates. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. It? Oh, it's still, it's still new, newish. Yeah, maybe yeah, six yeah. Months, new enough. It? New enough. Yeah. Um, but 
we're having a little look at them now. They've had quite a lot of uh, software updates and stuff. But I mention this, though, because I think this, something that I'm, I'm particularly interested in with this is how it differs from the, um, how it differs from the groove boxes, well, that came before it. This is uh -huh. the first groove box Roland have made since 2007. So... You know, considering Roland invented the groove box, I suppose. I mean, yeah, yeah. The MC three hundred three came out in what was that about ninety six or something? Yeah, that was just Around. over there, right? It was on a rack of stuff. Uh, it was on top. <laughs> uh, the the SR ten was underneath. Yeah, the Elysis drum machine underneath. Right. The MC three hundred three was on top, so you could just about reach the mm. D beam like this, and you could set right. that going. And no one knew how to work it because it was complete mystery. <laughs> but you could just oh, randomly yeah. twizzle things, and it would come up with a with a dance tune. Yeah. And again, you'd all around. <laughs> so now <laughs> the thing that the, the, the bit is different though is that um, where those devices then and the as they went from the three hundred three, I think was it to the five hundred five, and then they mm -hmm. did a eight like mc808 and there's a whole bunch of them and the mc909 that was the big the big one uh they were trying to essentially compete with a computer but you know like it like mm, like yeah, it, yeah. it's a full it's a full production sort of system um now with what they've done kind of with this though because this is kind of like badged as an ira product um you know it's got eight tracks, yeah. you know. It's not trying to do loads of tracks. It's not trying to be like a sixty-four track sequence. So it's got it's eight tracks. So so that for a start makes it kind of different from the way they were going. You know, it kind of goes. You no, know, instead of it trying to, I mean, it has got a ludicrously complicated um, synth engine in it. Yes. I say complicated. Um, you know, it's the it, it is an evolution of that that started with the D50. It really is, you know, the partials and you know, but it's uh, four partials um, per synth engine, and you can run eight synth engines simultaneously. Um, but I think whereas like the groove boxes of the past were kind of trying to uh, be DJ kind of dance music -y, um you know that's that's what they were focused on being this thing is has a lot more kind of modern you could definitely um connect this to your euro rack uh, uh, and in fact uh -huh, you see you see you can see where my segue is now here because this acts as a sampler you could use this as a really cool way of kind of multi-tracking your yeah. um your stuff with using the using it maybe this as the as the master clock as well and the, yeah. so long as you've got a way to it's got no gate outputs on it sadly that feels that feels like a bit of a missed missed opportunity on it i think it, i think it should have i think it should have yeah, but it does yeah. have uh, it does have two midi outs uh so you could can stick that use... into something interesting and split that out to CV gate, couldn't you? That's that's yeah. not difficult these days uh, with a little no. module or a little box. But it's interesting because you know, there's a lot of MPC around at the moment as well. I, I kind of feel there's um, there's been a lot of scattergun approach to the groove box. In you know, there's the electron stuff, which is you know, very very competent, but perhaps difficult. Yeah. <laughs> dare I say? Um, and then so there's been. Yeah, yeah, and there's things like the deluge, which seems huge and perhaps ungainly, mm. but again, it's trying to do it. And there's there's this sense that you're trying to find a music recording platform mm. that can work for people who want yeah. to hang out beats, but also somebody who wants to record yeah. vocals and wants to record something else who doesn't want to have to go into yes. the computer. So it's this no. wrestling match we have between yeah. something which is almost as good as a computer, mm. but is easy to use mm. as hardware because we've had that Porter Studio yeah. hole in our lives for a yes. long time and we're trying Hallelujah. to fill it's, yeah and we're trying we to fill to... that hole yeah yeah i'm desperate for a new era of the porter studio now with groove boxes i've, I've mentioned this before on some of the thing you know sonic i think um i call the i don't like the term groove box i think it's really dated it sounds like a nine it sounds like a 90s dj kind of thing doesn't it groove box mm -hmm. i call them well 
I would like to call them infinity boxes. But in order uh, to in order to have the term infinity box, it needs to be able to do you know polyrhythmical stuff it needs to be able to do non-time based stuff so you can do you know so stuff can happen um in you know things not locked to grid just everything yeah. loose um so i mean like for instance that thing you could have heinbach style kind of noise scapes on each channel and, and and just literally do a performance of of morphing noise and sound uh you know nothing to do with dance music whatsoever nothing to do with groove mm. either you know um but i guess the, yeah, the, so, you comes loaded with a whole load of content which is going to push you in that direction anyway you know the, the demo songs are all going to be banging and the the loops and stuff that it ships with are all going to be fall to the floor or you know the, the latest whatever whatever the kids are listening to these days uh, so <laughs> i think in some ways it's an uphill battle to try to get um to, to fight the grid out of these systems, maybe? Fight the grid out of the systems, yeah, great. So I'm, my chat, what I'm going to be doing uh, tomorrow, my plan tomorrow, is I'm going to see if I can write a psychedelic pop song on nice. this. So with vocal harmonies and, you know, uh, and nothing at all like what you'd expect off a, a, a groove box or a, a glove box, as they were kind of more often called. Um <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I love that Japanese thing of R's and L's. You know, it's just a really peculiar quirk of the Japanese of getting the R's and L's the wrong way round. <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah, it's just. I think it's they don't have. I can't remember. There's a reason for it. It, it was explained to me. Um, but yeah, that's that's not xenophobic any, in any way. I don't think. No, is it? it's, it's just too, curious. Curious yeah, is like what a, it is. Like a curious thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I played with a Japanese drummer for well for a short while in the nineties. You know, and he would just just talk about the quality of the glove. You know, <laughs> I liked it. I liked it. It's, you know, it's something. You know, I, yeah. <laughs> I'm not digging myself into a hole there. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, let, let's let's crash into a bit of Eurac then. So I uh, I've been enjoying your little uh, adventure, which it's just been Thank great. I mean, it's it's because it yeah because I, I felt like I've been the newbie for quite a long time, and it's nice right. to see somebody else. So I can I can look at you and going ah yeah I remember being like that yeah I want to obviously yeah. like that. But it, it's been uh, it's been marvelous, and uh, just to comment on hmm. on last night's show because I thought I just thought it was brilliant because it showed something important about Eurorack. I think because we're forever in these arguments about synths and Eurorack. Oh, why not just get a synth anyway? But it was um, you were just sort of struggling, and it was in that struggle that I thought that's really interesting. That's that's what makes Eurorack both troublesome and amazing. Yeah. Because there was a point where you weren't really sure what was happening. You couldn't work out where the sound was coming from or how to make the sound sound like you thought it should. Because there's so many things that could be messing it up. It could be the filters down. It could be the volume over here. It could be this cable's actually plugged into an out when it should be plugged into an in. There's numerous yeah. ways that it could be a disaster. But that's... Yeah. Euro Eurorack is yeah. about that chaotic struggle from disaster into something beautiful. And then you ruin it somewhere else. <laughs> but uh, what happened on the show yesterday was um uh I, oh and that didn't quite work i was trying to do a, i was trying to do a fancy oh i was, I was, I was oh. gonna do a, what happened on the show yesterday oh right. my goodness <laughs> uh I was, yeah flicking to my show my show my show camera there um <laughs> i i i did actually plug something in i was using the angle grinder and yeah, i just yeah, did right. plug in and at one point, I just plugged something in, and it was oh, that sounds alright. Oh, sounds like I just plug it in something else, just like this, like random. Oh. Oh. No, I don't know. You know, I wasn't expecting that, but then I think it's those little joyful. Um, I've been, I, and I'm typical for this, overthinking things and being a little bit more cautious about about doing stuff because I'm trying to understand it all in my yes. head about what's going on maybe being slightly reticent just to just not to, to just not worry about that and it does bring to mind something a little bit um 
Somebody who checked in on the show yesterday was Angie Pollock. Now, I've played with Angie um, with the Underworld thing uh, that I did and, 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 and a few other things. Uh, Angie is the, goal, the keyboard player in Gold Frap and also with oh. Peter Gabriel as well, which is one of the greatest jobs in music, isn't it? The, the, <laughs> the, the, the Peter Gabriel. Um, but it's a wonderful, wonderful keyboard player. Now, why I mention her is um, she's brilliant on the MS-20. Put her on an MS-20 and she just combination of her wonderful keyboard skills but she just gets she just dials in these fantastic sounds now she doesn't know what she's doing necessarily she doesn't know that if she's like modulating the filter with an lfo yeah. or th she's more like i know that when i turn this it does this to the sound and i know that i can utilize that for a funky kind of riff the crucial thing there was is though is that she's not actually that bothered about knowing mm. what the real thing a difference between blokes and, and and women i think to a certain degree i think you know that i mean this is a generalization and i apologize for anyone who says why uh, but uh, i've got another friend female friend i play in a band with and, and she's the same she plays an octave kitten um helen stanley amazing she's really fantastic again she doesn't she knows it we do gigs. She's repatching with its, uh, its octave kitten. So it's an all analog synth. She's having to change all the parameters around. Um, and she just does it really, really fast. She's had it for years and she knows it intimately. But she doesn't know the principles of synthesizers and she doesn't know necessarily why that does that to mm, that. But she mm. knows what, uh, you know to the sound. Uh, and that's what's important as a, you know, but I was like, you know, Definitely, us people with a beard, especially, are kind of like, hmm, that's what I wonder, wonder why that is. <laughs> and I need to know why that is, mm -hmm. you know. But and, that's the, that's the, the drop you get when you move from a from a synthesizer world, a synthesizer paradigm, into Eurorack. You suddenly realise that you don't have any idea how synthesizers work. You thought you did, or at least this was my experience. Right. Was that because yes. I knew that if I twiddled yes. that, it would it would do that. I don't didn't know why it's like i had this whole mental block about envelopes i assumed the signal went through an envelope not that an envelope acted on something else but because on a synthesizer it appears to for all intents and purposes right. but when That's moving to euro rack <laughs> yeah you're then going i've got yeah, to yeah. know how this goes i've got to understand the signal flow and it is a you know it's hard I, I, i'm glad you mentioned that though because that was mm. the real penny drop about needing VCAs. You know, mm. there is a famous uh, Myla Melodies video about you can never have too many VCAs. And I'm still thinking, oh, I don't need VCAs. What the no, hell? They don't no. do anything. Yeah. They're just a little mix. Then we, <laughs> yeah. And then, and then it's like, oh, yeah. Because I, I was doing, like with the angle grinder, for instance, I, I realized, you know, in order to, um, do you know what the angle grinder is? Do you know the schlappy angle grinder? It's I a, do a little, a yeah. A peculiar little module there but um it's like oh i'm taking the output of that out and taking that into the mixer but then where do i envelope how do i modulate the envelope i need it to go into a vca and then my envelope can modulate the vca and then i and it was like oh yeah it's the thing that you did but I think you, that I hadn't quite thought about it as you just said it. Then that's how we, you know, certainly with the the M1 and the D50 onwards, the envelope just is in the is in the signal path. Mm. Yes. <sighs> yeah, it's, it's funny. Yes. It's funny, and you don't know it till you don't till you discover that you don't know it. And there's all these modules, and you've spent a whole uh, load of money, and you can't make it. You can't make it make a basic sound. <laughs> <laughs> it's just yeah, oh it's yeah. just so, so funny i mean i remember but funny enough i mean this is all still i'm still working this out i mean even last year at Toman, i sat there for 10 minutes doing a video trying to get the crave and the micro freak to talk to each other and i couldn't do it right. and the reason i couldn't do it is i didn't connect the gate because it just didn't occur to me i sat there going but i'm sending <laughs> cv I'm, so why is that not yeah it's yeah. not and it's i said i hadn't CV. connected the gate yeah yeah. So there you go. And I sat up for 10 minutes scratching my head, which I edited out of the video when I put it up online, of course. But I sat there feeling like um, a complete idiot. Wow, I don't, can't get nothing to work. But, you know, we all, we're all learners. Yes. We're all on we, we are. We are, absolutely. And, you know, a few things which is super cool. I mean, I, I'm, 
oh gosh, you know, I, I can see this uh, a bunch of people in the chat room tonight who check in uh, uh, to my show too. It's awesome. We've got such a brilliant um, community. Yeah, we uh, do. Yeah, and um, I feel ever so grateful to be part of that. And you know, the, the, the Synth React the last year was such a fantastic event just to pull a lot of us YouTubers together in one place. Uh, and like, it's like, God, I can't believe how much we all get on. But then it's like, <laughs> oh yeah, but well, you know, what's led us to do what we do is a sort of like-mindedness. So actually yes. put a load of like mind together and it was extremely positive and, uh, you know, no egos, nothing. I didn't get any of that at all. Uh, you know, like I could imagine maybe other things could be, but it felt r remarkably devoid of, 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 of ego, really. Well, yeah, it did. I mean, people naive. found people found their their groove and what they wanted to do. I think um, more or less. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was nice. I mean, we were just gearing up for it this year, weren't we? It was just starting to oh, to snowball, oh, all the information so and the chat about so it. And... I did. Ah, oh, um, <laughs> you know, like when we arrived last year, you know, we kind of would be, uh, there was a little kind of private discussion group going on where people, you know, people who were invited were to have a little, uh, you know, little kind of, you know, ponder about what was what. But once we were actually there, um, Two people really, um, Sam Battle, look, mum, no computer, yeah. and um, Simon, Pie. yeah, they were out and running, they were just straight away going, Right, we're gonna just make the most of this and do That's right. Really they said we could do anything, so fuck it, we're gonna do anything. <laughs> they did, <laughs> yeah, so. So, like, th like this year, then I mean, I got some great ideas, I'm, I'm keeping them. I'm keeping them stumped, just in, you know, just hoping that it'll happen next year. Uh, but there is discussion now that Nam isn't going to happen next year. You know, really? Sort of just, I don't, yeah, that isn't confirmed. I think that is just speculation. But um, oh, I gosh, assumed that was know. about the summer Nam. Oh, I didn't realise you were talking about. I saw a bit of that talking about the next. Oh, NAM. maybe it's summer. Maybe so it's summer. That makes, yeah, that makes more oh. sense. Maybe. Hmm. But, but I mean, uh, America is a disaster, yeah. isn't it? So <laughs> yeah. I don't know how yeah. many people actually want to go. Uh, with all greatest respect to our to our lovely American cousins, yeah. but um, oh, it's hard, gosh. man. It it's to... hard to watch. Yeah, I've been in the states twice this year. You know, just just before the lockdown kicked in, and I was meant to be coming back for uh, an event that I was going to be organising. I won't. I don't want to talk much about this, but uh, I was brought in to do this event that was going to happen in September and uh, that was related to synths and music technology and it was going to be fantastic mm. and I got and I'd gone out there to you know it, so whether next year can muster the same enthusiasm for this project uh, we'll, we'll see yeah. but um you know, gosh. Anyway, but let's let's go back to Eurorack because that's yes. the fun stuff. That's the fun yes. stuff. And that's the fun so, stuff. So um, yesterday hmm. you were using uh, the little blue glowy big screen sequencer uh, called the that. Yes. That's it. That's there. it. How are you there. finding that? That's an interesting little box. It's brilliant. I mean, uh, you know, on my show, yes, my plan, <laughs> my plan was I, I first shown it like in my show two weeks ago uh or rather a week ago rather and i was thinking oh i'll i'll learn it so because i'd only it, it just arrived uh, the day before i hadn't hardly touched it so i thought oh i'll uh, i'll learn it and then do it this week and i didn't <laughs> so, I learned, I pretty, so my show yesterday was me pretty much learning it and yeah, uh, yeah. but 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 end of the show actually i would recommend if anyone wants to just go go to my yesterday's show and skip to the end because that's when i started putting all of the elements together and uh that's when i started to really think oh this thing is lovely remind us it's what it's called again bit. it's called the noodle box that's from right. 64 pixels. yeah and um 64 pixels is a uh, basically a guy jason jason hotchkiss who's uh, based out of brighton uh, he's been making some really fabulous problem solving things. He does the CV, uh, the OCV, oh, the, oh, is it OCD, OCVD? Oh, I, can't, I can't remember. It's a uh, uh, maybe CV converter. 
uh, and some other cool things. I think what's really neat about this thing, though, is um, it's got a lovely build quality. So the encoders and the buttons, they all feel really nice to use. The big, the huge, big blue LEDs, yeah. uh, they're just glorious. They're just yeah, really, yeah. really nice. Um, and it's it's a four-channel sequencer, so you can do four CV. It's got four CV outs and four gates outs. So obviously, you need to get the gates going in <laughs> as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so get... I hear. So, I, so, so they tell me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but it's it's very 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 performer focused and i was flapping this thing up a lot yesterday and that's the kind of uh the the, the kind oh, of cheat sheets that come it. but look it's laminated to kind of uh well you know to be you know you can skin up on it you can do things on it you know it's designed <laughs> to survive studio activity um and I think that's a really nice touch. And I wish more manufacturers would include that. You know, whenever mm. there's anything that is that involves an abstraction to the use of it, you know, um, being able to, you know, have something to learn. Because actually, when you look at this, the amount of short, you can kind of get the gauge of just how much the little sequence it can do by just yeah. how many. Sh Isn't short it about layers that? modulating each other and sequences? running sequences yes. something like something of that nature mm. yes yeah i haven't done any of that just yet but you can yeah so you could for instance have like one note layer going and then another layer could be modulating the pitch of that right. note right. like of that other sequencer and and because all of the different of the four layers can all run at different times uh then it can um you know yeah you could have it doing sort of slower changes and uh Where's where's that thing? Uh, uh, oh, it's here. Uh, this thing, which oh, is yes. called the it's noodler, noodler, noodler so as well, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah noodle box it. and noodler. Yes. Yeah. So noodles is, you know, the term now. <laughs> it seems like well, if there's two, if there's two good units on the market using the term noodle it sort of makes me think it's got to be you know an official term now for i think um, so yeah now i use it all the time suddenly i use it much more <laughs> yeah. than jam right because jam feels like you need to have two people in the room whereas noodle is yeah, just you you know is you playing, playing with yourself as it were <laughs> i am an expert at that yes <laughs> now <laughs> um as are as are as are all as are all of the people into music technology by, by, by it goes with the territory i find it goes with the territory <laughs> now the noodler is such a different thing from the noodle box the two couldn't be more different other than the fact that this is a four channel device that mm. spits out notes and that's a four channel device that spits out notes um and like but the, the the approach is just so radically different. It, it it glorious. I love the difference between them, and and I think this is something. I mean, obviously these aren't Eurorack devices, but this does completely connect to to, to the Eurorack world in that um, small like single people. In this case, a noodler is two guys, but I think Noodlebox is like one guy. But you know, small little yeah. companies able to make and manufacture and distribute globally products is just you know is an astonishing thing and something that just simply really was just so hard to do in the past and you know yeah God, i mean um something that i didn't really fully appreciate but uh, with um and this well the same the same is with uh, effects pedals as well but with eurorack is that when you are shipping stuff internationally, if there's a power supply, you know, the power supply has, it's the power supply that has to conform to yes. different countries' stringent rules of power, of power management, power distribution, or whatever. Now, with Eurorack modules not having any power supplies with them, with them purely, you know, connecting to the, the rack for power, it, that's something it's an under it's a kind of undervalued part of how the whole euro rack thing has managed to expand in the way that it does because you know things are not being caught up in bureaucracy of of the yeah the internet 
or uh, having to conform. You know, so if they're buying in uh, power supplies, they're having to make sure those power supplies are all rated correctly for the yes. countries. And you know, when you look at them, a, a power supply, there's all those small little insignias and yeah. logos of different countries, kind of thing. Blah blah blah. So that lack of bureaucracy has kind of really allowed for so much of that kind of you know the, the you know the guy yeah. or guy on the kitchen on the kitchen work surface yeah. kind of putting things together yeah and, and it very is much that. The same. it is absolutely that yeah. and you see it i mean you even see it with with people who you think are quite big like this is not rocket science you know they get around the kitchen table uh with a couple of friends and they're there soldering for the night making modules for people you think but how can that be the yeah. case it came in a really nice box it looks like it's professionally yeah. made. Well, they are professionally made. It's just in a homespun yeah. kind of way. And I, yeah. I find that fascinating. I find it fascinating that you could mm. the, you could make a module. You know, I mean, DivKid's been doing it now. Um, uh, you know, so it's, it's not so far away. And there's kids doing it. Kids just come up with ideas and they put it together and they start marketing it and selling it. It's just, it's an yeah. amazing thing. I love it. I, I, I think that's just... I would have done that at a drop of a hat had that been around in my day, but but sadly no. Uh, oops! Whoa! That all oops. went a bit wrong. <laughs> I was just trying to get a bit more light on there. Uh, I just knocked my beer over as well. That's, oh, uh, that's really sad. sad. That's cool. No, it's it's exactly what's expected of me. That's what happens in my studio. <laughs> I've had so many disasters live. Um, one of the funniest ones happened on um, Sonic Talk. I was, um, God, I'd got in, I'd, I was rushing back from a session, rushing back to get in. And I only made it with like a couple of minutes to spare. And my head wrapped around my studio chair. And um, I would take your the chair head to wrapped get... around your studio chair. Really? How did <laughs> you manage that? Do you mean your headphones? No. Was it your headphone cable? Oh, did I say my head? My head is <laughs> <laughs> no. wrapped around the um wrapped around the, the chair and then that caused the microphone stand that I had to topple over and uh and to smash into my sledge my synth my sledge oh wow tell you what this is so funny though you gotta check it out i can't remember what edition it is on um on uh sonic state but I have my in ears, my stage in ears in. I'd never use them normally. And they form a seal where you just cannot hear anything outside of it. So anyway, the microphone toppled. I didn't know because I'm <laughs> looking forward. And there's an almighty crash. And Nick switches back to me, goes, God, are you all right, Gaz? Is everything all right? I come, yeah. And then I turn <laughs> and look. And then all the carnage. And the microphone <laughs> smashed the top off. He smashed the key off the sledge. Uh, but on this episode that happens in, you can hear that crash. I mean, it's a mighty crash. Um, sort of. Uh, so yeah. So there's a certain amount of expectation that something yeah. like this is going to happen. This well, was very I mean, that, mild. That feeds back into you were saying earlier about not having time to learn something before you're you're then demoing it. And I think. I think that happens all the time. That happens to me all the time. I, I mean, I've even, I've kind of embraced it to the point if a new piece of gear turns up, I'll leave it in the box mm. until my next live stream and then just take it out and see what happens. Because nice. I, I always intend to learn stuff, but inevitably, yeah. until I'm actually getting around to making a video on it, it, that's the only time I sit down and really focus on it. And if I can do it during a live stream, then I find that's quite, people find that quite interesting. I think, I hope, well, you know, you well, convince yourself it's not boring. You just get on with it. Well, I did it. That's what I did last night in the end, you know, uh, pretty much, you know, bumbling, bumbling my way through it. And, um, oh, bless them. What a great audience, you know. Everyone's really helpful as well. And I, when I get stuck, it's like, oh, chat room. And then the chat room delivers, you know. They do, so, yeah, again. yeah, yeah. There's something that I think there's, it's it's slightly car crash TV, I suppose. There's something, uh, I mean, uh -huh. I, I experience it myself with people sitting there going, why has he plugged that into that? Or he's saying, no, you haven't plugged this into there. That's why I'm sitting there going, oh, I don't seem to be getting any sound. People, there's all this stuff coming up in the chat saying, why oh, you want to plug that into there, mate? And <laughs> yeah, stuff. Yeah. It is totally brilliant. And uh, I guess that's, maybe that's why we're interesting is because we're not, we're not the, we're not the polished. We're not the Stephen Slates. We're not the... Uh, 
uh, not cool. all the pizzazz and the shininess. Um, but that's, I think that makes, makes it interesting. I had a funny Stephen Slate story now he mentioned that. My first time I was in Nam. I don't know um, why he came into oh, mind. Oh, God, no. But because, I mean, he does the kind of super serious, you know, he's like kind of, um, you know, Stephen Slate. It's so, <laughs> everything's so smooth. It's like he doesn't yeah. actually have any pores on his face. You know, oh, he's, no, I don't... <laughs> I, I wouldn't fancy my chances fighting him. I reckon he would like, I reckon he's probably like black belt and, you know, I reckon, you know. But he'd I, have I, an entourage I, I, as well. It'd be them that would lay into you. He'd be no, opening, his, uh, opening his cocktails <laughs> in the top of his limo. <laughs> but um, so, um, oh God, this on this is online as well. So you can see this, but it was honestly, it was, it was just pure comedy. It was lovely. It was so funny. Uh, so I, he was doing, they were demonstrating the, um, they got this audio interface and this microphone combo that can, the audio interface and the microphone can then be subject to uh, model, different models and stuff, you know, and it's, you know, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of not so much into that idea anymore. I, I used to be about the idea of something that you buy, a, you know, an object and it can be yes. loads of different things. Nowadays, I just want to buy something that's just yeah. it, and that's I'm all exact, it is. It's I'm not... with you, hundred percent. Yeah, <laughs> right. right. Um, you know, but you know, a big part of this set sale, sales sales pitches that you know that, that one microphone could be an SM57, it could be a, a you know um, a U87, it could be a you know a C um, a C12, or, you know, it could be any of these classic mm. mics um anyway they were doing this um he was doing this demonstration and i was walking past i didn't plan on going but i saw him doing it. i thought oh god i bet this will be this will be worth watching uh he, you know he definitely he definitely puts on a show uh so he was doing this thing he had a band set up on stage and it was all mic'd up with these you know, all the same mics oh, the magic and, uh, mics yeah uh, and I was stood near the front, and I don't know if he recognised me or if I if it was just a it was probably more the hair and the beard. But he kind of singled me out, and uh, he's going, "What's so gas?" And he said, "What kind of name is gas?" And I was thinking, you know, he's saying this on stage, just <laughs> so, so like I go, just you know, I don't know what kind of name is it. I don't know, but anyway, he just kept he kept going so. Gaz, what microphone should we use on the drums? Uh, on, on the kick drum. So I was trying to think, what's the worst bass drum mic? Or a D one one twelve, D one one twelve, please. So that's well, not the worst. It's I've, they're fine. I got one. It's fine. But it's you know, it's um, <laughs> the generic one you'd use. Um, but anyway, he's, he's doing this this demonstration, and he's sort of uh, he's got a beer in his hand as well, and you know, he's got his hair slicked back, and yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then next thing happens, this like thunderous noise drums starts happening. And it's like, you can't, it, you know, it's so overpowering the, the sound of the show. And it was a marching band and they amassed directly behind the slate stand. So he's trying to do this. He's trying to do this. He's trying to do this demonstration as this, you know, and he loses, he, he gets really, he's just going, He's calling his minions, you know, can we go and sort this out? You know, he's like, he, you know, he really doesn't like having his shtick interrupted. You know, it sort of, it oh, kind, of sure, uh, yeah. kind of threw him. I, do you know what? I, 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 I do like him. I've decided, but you know, I mean, he is kind of funny as well, but yeah. this, um, but this thing, he, he kind of gets really kind of rawr, and getting really riled about it. Um, but the video now, if you do a YouTube search, I'm not entirely sure. I might have to check this. But if you do a YouTube search for um, Stephen Slate, I think it might be the top result now about him losing it at Nam. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so it's you know, it's it's. Um, yeah, uh, I'm. Yeah, I'm at the front, and he does. If you watch that video, he does. You can hear him kind of going gas as he sort of thought. <laughs> oh, that was really annoying. I mean, I mean, I don't know about you, but I mean, I'm finding as a reviewer of things, I have I have to hold on to stuff quite lightly because manufacturers. Uh, I mean, because you know, we talked about Eurorack. Sometimes it's just one person in a shed, 
putting this together and it's their life's work and you've got it in your hands going oh, pfft, you know, it's a bit yeah. like this bit like this but you kind of have to you can't take it too seriously otherwise it becomes overwhelming and you can't yeah. you can't navigate ways of trying to be you know, positively critical of things i think that's that's the line i try to walk to be a to be a critic but to, to do it in a smiley positive jokey kind of way yeah. but not all manufacturers can handle that they can't you know they sometimes i feel they just need to, to release just a little bit yeah because they yeah. have to understand that it's not it's never going to be perfect i'm always going to find a hole somewhere and it's not yeah. personal and it's important no. to just to just so that you know that there's always more that we want to have i think yeah. so steven slate yeah. is the same i think I, i've grown to like yeah. him in as much as i think yeah. he is being funnier than i think he is i initially think he's just really smug yeah. but actually there's no. some humor behind there and he's a human yeah. and i've you know i've got to let that i think he's i think, he, I think he's pretty go. cool actually. i think it's pretty cool i think he's yeah. but you know i think he's also kind of i think he's he sort of set he's setting himself up to have the mickey <laughs> taken out of it a little yes. bit as well though yeah. You know. Especially by the British, yeah. you know, he's is a it's an American persona which is something which just oh, rests with us. That's sad. Yeah, he you know. is, he is like the epitome of that difference, isn't he? If mm. ever there was anyone, you know, I, another person who does it in a completely different way, in a much big bigger hearted way, is is Eric Persing, who is probably the master of the uh, of the um presentation. Do you know Eric from Spectrosonics? He, oh, you know, so right, when yes. like the atmosphere display you know eric's eric is the man when it comes to doing just absolutely just wonderful presentations he is superb and but i mean to give Stephen slate his juice you know he's really good at it too but there's there's one video that i watched one time on youtube where he's demonstrating the vocals and he starts singing and he's like a real Yo, I can <laughs> he's singing like rah. <laughs> and it's like okay yeah 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 um, well you've got to believe in yourself haven't you uh, a spectrosonics have to say now there's a company that doesn't seem to have released anything for 20 years i remember being at nam at the end of the 90s and you know all their stuff they were new and exciting and atmosphere and right. you know just moving into omnisphere and then it's kind of yeah. I, I keep waiting yeah. for the next one i keep waiting for the next well, one i, think, I mean there, there's been I the keyboard way, thing but yeah well omnisphere and well it did go to i mean Om omnisphere came out what 2009 it's had its second release of you know as in yeah. 2.0 uh but it's so utterly brilliant mm. you know it's so utterly brilliant in terms of uh in terms of of a, a singular piece of software that achieve that that um that sets out to do what it does which is like power synth it calls itself power yeah. synth yeah, yeah. um is it's so utterly brilliant and it is so bottomless and it's so huge hearing is a bit of a problem for me and it's nothing to i mean i've used omnisphere on countless projects it's been a, it, it's you know it's a it's, yeah. a it's a standard now it's an absolute standard but you know the thing is with something like that it's just really really difficult to know you in fact it's not difficult it's impossible to know it it's so vast you can only ever just you know operate it uh, as an, as, as an example, like an SH-101, you can learn all of the controls and you can pretty much learn all of the extremities of it uh, fairly fast. There's a, a million things you can do with it, but you can understand mm. it, you yeah. understand what... Yeah. To my left here is the Dreadbox Abyss, which I was using yesterday, is another good example. I know it really, really well. Oops, there it goes. There it goes again. There it goes. Hello. Now look, you can There's see what my waving desktop at myself. is Hello, hello, and we, hello, that room. hello. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's back. hilarious. Yeah, so that happens on my show all the time. But actually, that also shows that when we are grooving, rocking and a rolling, you know, time just flies. <laughs> um, but yeah, but I, I, you know, like with the abyss, I can know it. I can know what it can do. So... Um, and to a lesser extent, you're a rack. You're kind of knowing it as you build it. You kind of, you know, yeah. even though there's all this incredible potential, you're still kind of expanding from a place. Whereas Om Omnisphere just gives you this infinity to start mm -hmm. with. And 
And when you get into what you can do with it, especially over the eight parts, and each part can be consist you know consist of in in Roland terms like four partials and four layers, and what each layer can be, and the fact you can have eight of those layers when you create a multi. You'd never reach the end of it, and it's. So I, I mean, I think that, that, that's that's ex a, a perfect example of the software hardware dilemma. I think it was something. Mm. It was along those lines about that sort of time that I was starting to lose faith in in software, because I mean, I, I'm a big mm. fan of pads. I love a big, warm pad, and I loved atmosphere. Uh, I got started in Omnisphere and was like, mm, yeah, but I just couldn't fit it in anything. I could play it by itself and thoroughly have a nice afternoon just playing these huge evolving sounds that move about, yeah. but I could not fit it in a track to to make mm. anything. I would have to take out layers and layers and layers just to have I, a, something simple, Yeah, you know, yeah. so that I could I mean, play I, along with it. And it's then, too enormous. You know, this, no, but this is the thing. You know, that is very, that is an absolutely, you know, spot on um, assessment. But with the 2.5 update and with the whole kind of um, hardware integration, one yeah, of the, that's one very of the, interesting. One of, oh, yeah. And one of the side things of that, though, is the enormous libraries you get. Essentially, you get of all, every synth that the hardware, you know, that works as a hardware controller comes with now a library of sounds of, of essentially that gives every user that synth. So, you know, uh, or, or not that synth, but a, a, you know, an enormous amount of 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 kind of um, key sounds of that particular synth that are very different from those massive, huge Omnisphere patches. You know, they they, they can just be kind of thin, little reedy sounds, or you know, um, you know, like a kind of glossy synth lead, but just that's not huge. It's it, but then that is still kind of connects with the point that i'm making though it's just mm. it's kind of like it's like yeah okay game over this is it now this is like the the, the ultimate synth software synth i guess you know like because the, the granular stuff in there is amazing when you factor it all <laughs> together it's just like you know it's just like so far out in front in in my opinion yeah so much so that i'm like okay i don't need to get any i literally feel like that i don't mm -hmm. need any more software i've got the arturia v collection and i've got N native complete yes uh and with omnisphere as well uh that's what else pretty much got? nailed isn't it yeah that's that is pretty much it i mean but i mean that's too much for me it's just yeah. too all of that that i've got is well, you way can drop more in than I need. I, the I, there's an ik multimedia one as well the syntronic you can drop that one in if you hadn't thought of it but, i mean the thing is because every day I, I write for gear news uh, every day whatever comes out and yet yeah. again i'm writing about another software synthesizer that's turned up and at some mm. point i'm gonna have to say to myself what's the point i mean there's <laughs> There's another one, yeah. and it does the same. Well, does, do they all do something different? I mean, you're able to talk about it as if it's new and exciting because yeah. it is to some degree. Yeah. But trying to, yeah. to there's so much trying to find a yeah. way through to do something interesting and different. I think is really yeah. hard. But then we How that's the same make... with synths. I mean, we we all like an oscillator and a filter and an envelope and a VCA, and we keep yeah. doing that over and over and over again, and that seems to still be okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> see, I will use I will use my abyss in all its limitations. Uh, I will use that on a, on a session, or I would take that along to a session, uh, and invariably it will get used quite a bit because it's got a lot of character, mm. and also there's something about those limits that I was mentioning that it's like yeah. That, that's that's just you know like you whip out an acoustic guitar that's just what it is you know that acoustic guitar isn't this you know hasn't got loads and loads of neck sticking out of it and <laughs> diego stockwell style <laughs> you know it, 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 it's <sighs> so i think there's a lot of a I, for me it's uh, like things that don't do an awful lot but what they do do very well that's something that holds huge huge appeal i think yes. that's in a way why i love dreadbox i think you know ah the typhon 
Have you mm. seen the Typhon, the new? Box? Yeah, that- I mean, uh, it was funny. I was, uh, it came, it first uh, appeared. I saw some leaks about it, and then I was going somewhere, uh, going away or something for the weekend, and I just caught it as the video came out. So I wrote it up, knowing nothing about it. Wrote it up, going, "Oh, fantastic synth, blah blah blah." It's got some things. I had no clue. I came back a couple of days later, and everyone was going crazy for it. And I'm going, "What? What? What is it? It's just a little box." <laughs> got some sign vibes effects in that's nice but you know i hadn't spent any time with it at all <laughs> but i it's, understand it's that vibes. it's very very good is this sign vibes yeah i always thought it was cine vibes sign vibe oh it uh, might be i don't yeah. know i've never heard anybody <laughs> say it out loud <laughs> ah. uh, so um the, you know i i think that thing about just having a core great sound and yeah. I, I think that's uh you know that's what dreadbox do really i think the, the you know the oscillators um famously the oscillators on the erebus now i can only speak of, about this of the erebus version 2 i don't know if this is absolutely applicable with version the version 3 and i'm really interested in this mm. um the, the the oscillators on the erebus various people had said to me people who are really in the know saying that they're the best sounding oscillators that they'd ever heard for just doing standard, say, sawtooth um, or square wave, um, that they were the fi- the best sounding oscillators or, or if not the best, you know, amongst the best sounding mm. oscillators ever made. Now, they, when they moved to the version 3, they, they've gone from the, the through-hole way of ma- making stuff, i.e., takes a lot of work yeah, and a lot yeah. of uh, money to uh, an SMD approach, which obviously this, this new Typhon is um, is using, and uh, I think the chromatic range, and also the, the, the Nix version 2 as well. Um, I think the Erebus is still back, you know, the Erebus, sorry, not the Erebus, the Abyss here, this is back from its kind of through-hole days as well. So I think Dreadbox there's a, a point in time now where there's the, the through hole ones and then there's the sort of SMD. Now, this is an interesting uh, little thing here is Yanis reckons that they sound just as good and possibly even better, the SMD stuff. <laughs> um, and I'd love to get, now I'd love to get my Erebus and the, the, and a version three Erebus and just do a side by side side comparison. Um, just very curious about it. Just, mm. I think there's something, what I've always thought with the Erebus, why it sounds good, is almost like a, an agricultural quality to it, you know, sort of, that is so kind of raw and, you know, imagine inside it, you know, there's, there's all bits of straw and various yeah. things, you know. Um, but uh, it's, um, I, you know, I, I think as well, though, there is a romantic, a bit of a romantic notion of people putting things together, you know, and having to solder yeah. it and doing it the long way around. Yeah, um, no, there is. It feels like it, it gets computerized um, somehow, uh, you know. Yeah. It feels like it's pick and place, that it's there's, <laughs> there's a human element that's missing, which is not, in many ways, is nonsense, but it's, it's perception but really is everything, important. you know. Yeah, it's perception, isn't it? You know, just sort of. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I'm really super thrilled though for Dreadbox to have had a success with this uh, this new one, the Typhon. Just because, you know, I don't know. From the beginning, I've been rooting for them in a way. Just just yeah. love what they do. And, yeah, well, and they've had a good weird. run of interesting bits and pieces, haven't they? I mean, uh, funny right. enough, I mean the uh, Erebus. I, I've called it the Erebus. I don't know if that's a problem. Anyway, so, but, but I think that was Erebus. Erebus with a, a V sound on the oh, B. I see, Erebus. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. Properly, but Erebus, I think, uh, <laughs> yeah. But the, when I <laughs> when I started my my push into synthesizers again this time around after taking on gear news and stuff, the three that I looked at was the Mother 32, the Make Noise, No Coast, and the Erebus. Erebus. Mm. They were the three that I played with at Synthfest that year. I just went round each stand because they were a few shops and they all had them out. And I would just fiddle and then go off and then fiddle. It was, it was very interesting. Definitely those three were the ones that I thought, I've got to get one of these. And I ended up getting nice. the other two, funnily enough. I got the Mother 32 and the No Coast. Never did quite right. get the uh, the Rebus. But I, no, I want to visit Dreadbox again uh, at some point. Definitely. Well, I mean, I think the Typhon, the Typhon to me looks like almost uh, just, I don't know, just when they get something 
just right. Um, Because the previous Dreadbox um, collaboration, and I've got one in front of me here, um, the Medusa. The Medusa, collaboration with Polyend was not an entirely happy kind of thing. Although I think what's happened is when it when the Medusa came out, it wasn't quite ready. I think I think that's the problem, really. Uh, I think it got a bad rep because it wasn't quite ready. And there's been well, it's on a version three firmware now. Uh, and the uh, I think really what's happened is um, Polyend really up 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 the game a little bit and have made the Medusa into something that is now yeah really what it perhaps should have been at launch mm. um and the thing about the medusa the the difference one of the big differences between the medusa and well in mean, this huge differences but the um the the typhon has built in stereo effects yes and the medusa doesn't have any effects at all and it's a mono output and it's a shame with the medusa i think if they'd have done a somehow if they could have made like some sort of stereo like if the digital aspect of the medusa could be stereo and you could pan out those voices and and have the uh the analog voice the analog voices somehow panable as well if there was some way to make it a stereo device i think it would have been probably a better decision Mm. so i think it's quite interesting that oh and yeah and the lack of effects you just need to plug it into an effect the medusa really it just it's just crying out for effects but the fact that the um that the typhon has uh really good quality 96k processing as well the effects engine in the typhon um just a really great effects engine and the cine vibes oh sorry sign vibes cine vibes i don't know Chat, chat room, what is it? City vibes or side vibes? Uh, <laughs> um, but just the fact that there's been like a really high quality digital effect with a really high quality analog synthesizer. You know, yeah. it's that fusion of digital and analog in a really, really cool way, I think. So I did a review oh. of this fella for uh, Sound on Sound. Mm. Um, and mm. uh, I got in touch with Cyan Vibes, Cine Vibes, and other people as well, like Tim Shoebridge and um, oh, other ones I can't remember now, to try to get all their custom oscillators out of them. And I did a whole, a good a thousand words on all the custom oscillators, and they cut the whole thing. Oh, neat. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> which, is a, which is a real shame. I mean, I really feel for the, um, you know, people like Cyan Vibes you, who sent me the stuff. But uh, can you? Is there any way to just just to put? to publish it privately uh, yeah, publish maybe. It on your own channel well i, d- I did a mm-hmm. demo i did a demo of them all on the uh on the nts one because i mean I, I get myself tie myself up in knots over what i'm allowed to do and not allowed to do depending on the source of what it is that mm-hmm. i've been asked to do that makes sense so right. sound and sound have asked me to review something yeah. i don't feel oh, i can really yeah. make a video of it until i've finished that and oh yeah, I don't okay know. yeah like so i tie myself up in very... knots about it <laughs> <laughs> trying are, to be right are there any... They, sound and sound are an institution they are fantastic but I they know, are yeah. they are definitely of the old yes. older school of things you know yeah. shall we say um but yeah um but yeah so just i was gonna i, I was gonna ask you about electron really because my, oh, yeah. typically I, I i my two favorite companies i think of the last 10 years have been dreadbox and electron and they are poles apart from each other they're mm. almost like they're almost like um you know the dreadbox stuff is you know very much what you see is what you get a little bit less so on the typhon but certainly the case with the the abyss uh and the erebus um whereas electron it's all about you have to have it in your head you have to know you have to have that's why i'd call them cerebral devices with an electron device you need to have it in your mind you know if you you know you need to know what the synth engine is in your head mm. because you don't depend on what page you're on you know you don't get the visual information it's so you have to uh, and i think this is where a lot of people maybe struggle i mean i definitely struggle with them as well in in this way but the um you know having to have all of the really know it inside out and then once you know it inside out there's an amazing super lightning fast response to electron things so you know it's like 
a little bit like I was mentioning with the noodle box. So, you know, there's a thing of like fast and dish, dish, and they are influenced by computer games and by consoles and by, um, you know, uh, mm. like Chenk from Electric, the um, Street Fighter 2 master, you know, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, it's easily like your master, but, but there's a funny thing there about key combos and, do, 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 and just like being able to, um, being able to just go to what you want to, what you need to do super fast i mean you can you know once you've got that down and um, someone in the chat room edna's disco machine is going i hate the workflow i totally get it that workflow is you know in many ways an anathema to how people want to go about the synthesizers you know uh, you know i can mm. understand it i totally totally understand it but um i think my why i admire them so much is that they they have their vision and they have their philosophy and their design ethos and all of this kind of stuff that kind of all comes together in such a singular and unique uh, way of doing stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to make a video about uh, this thing here. That's the Electron Rhythm a Mark II. Uh, and I'm going to do a real clickbaity title on it saying the best drum machine of all time oh, interesting yes. see the thing i mean I, I have a i have a very i have a different view i think of electron and uh, some people have heard this from me before but i mean it's something that it's almost like therapy for me there's certain things I, I still haven't quite worked out of my system yet i mean uh, historically you see i'm a windows person and uh, the apple guys have just always pissed me off it's just how life is <laughs> yeah and uh, that there it. is a certain attitude that comes with Apple that it just grinds me. Mm -hmm. And I've always had a chip on my shoulder about it and I react to it. And I'm quite happy to, to stand on my own two feet and prove that my Windows machine is better than your OS yeah. machine. But anyway, and there's a I'm, few I'm, companies. I'm, I'm change. Yeah. And there's a few companies that, that fall into that, that, that category in my head, in my compartmentalizing that I do. So Ableton Live tends to drop into there a little bit. Uh, teenage engineering oh, I've got some over here mm -hmm. they drop into that as well electron also mm -hmm. and so for me it's very easy when my cynical back of the head stuff starts coming in uh, just to call them a bunch of knobs and kind of uh, dismiss it all out of hand you know right. it's like, oh yeah flipping knobby electron stuff it's all just a bit too a bit too posh a bit too hipster a bit too cool and I'm never going to be cool enough to be in that gang and so it's it then becomes mm. easy for me to poke fun at them, and uh, you know that seems uh, unkind, and I don't ever mean to be unkind, but some companies are quite it. easy to tease, you know. Yeah, I get it. I mean, yeah, Electron's kind of marketing and sort of everything is super cool, isn't it? It's very kind it of you know super sort very of slick Swedish, um, you know, and it is quite you know there is definitely a very strong Swedish thing there going on, you know. Yeah, where, yeah. Um, you know the Swedes are. Kind of very thinky cerebral people yeah. you know it is general i think uh, and there's, there's nothing you know, it's nothing to do with their, their product ultimately I, i've never actually played with any of it it just purely that it just triggers me and i yeah so like when I, the I model when the model samples came out whichever ones that came out first it's like that's the the dullest looking thing i've seen like ever and right. where's overbridge which is always my standard question oh that's interesting where's yeah. overbridge oh that's really interesting yeah. five years later where's overbridge you know, out. Th it's things like probably, that. It, yeah, I know, I know. And that, that's fantastic. I'm it, so yeah. pleased that it is. They, I mean, they bit off a bit more than they could chew, they found with Overbridge. I think it was a very ambitious idea. I think that, um, you know, yeah. it, well, you know about the vagaries of, of USB and yeah, some of yeah. the, you know, there's, there is, there are, you know, weird, there's a lot of weird stuff and trying to make it work on different platforms on all sorts mm. of different machines. You know and what they could really do. Is. I mean, what they were doing with analog heat and and that stuff, the stuff that it did work on, was like, wow, that's just yeah. amazing. How on earth are you doing that? And but it was yeah. just that promise. That was the problem. Is it's once you promise something, um, it you know you start to lose yeah. start to lose any kind of sense of proportion if you're not careful. They they always try to strive for quality though, and I think that's mm -hmm. where it bit them off. A little a bit them on the bum a little bit because you know they wanted to uh you know it was an ambitious thing but they wanted it to work properly and thankfully as far as i can tell uh it is working well i've got the analog heat by here which uh i think is a 
an absolutely mm. strong I think it's one of the best products you can buy i gotta be honest i really think so because it's so versatile you know i tell you one thing what the analog heat is fantastic for is to use as an audio interface to uh, i mean in my case it's my it's the way my ipad pro connects into my studio i do it through the usb because as of uh whenever it was the last major update it it, it turned it into a class compliant uh, audio interface right, right. as latest update of the digitone and the digitac does as well and what's really cool about that normally when you've got a device that acts as a class compliant device that's all it you know that you've got no kind of control over that but with the um the well i certainly can speak for the analog heat i don't have those other ones here but um you can choose exactly how the analog heat part lives in the class compliant audio interface so meaning you can make the processing happen um so the inputs your audio inputs go through the analog heat and then will get recorded or your clean inputs will go out oh. into the computer and the computer can then send back through the analog heat processing it you can it it gives you every single permutation of routing that you could possibly uh come up with and and again very electron and also maybe some people would say needlessly complicated because it's like, <laughs> oh, I just want to do this. But because it does all of these, it does, it, you know, it, it can fulfill any of these tasks. Um, one thing people sometimes forget, though, is if you set up your device to be an overbridge device, you have to remember to... Um, to turn Overbridge off if you want to use it as a standalone, as a oh. class compliant device. But it's also, uh, it's like a the, one of the earlier desktop effects units, you know, it, it's, that's something which is very big now uh, is having uh, more and more little desktop boxes which are effects more than just having a stock up. box, you know. And I think that's, that's really interesting because as you yeah. said before, a lot of synths don't have effects built in and so straight away, I mean this is what this is why I have this out of its box at the moment because I've been playing with the uh, I was playing with this today, having a good time, oh, yeah, I have to it. say. And uh, but it needed it needed something. So <laughs> this is what it needed. It needed the effects uh, delay and reverb from here, and then it was okay. really good as opposed to yeah, mm. you know. <laughs> okay, yeah. We love oh, no, I mean, effects. Oh god, me too. It keeps getting me out of a hole on my show when I'm doing some yoda rack noodling. You know, yes. I just uh, want to put the effects on the back. Yeah, so let's talk about that again then. Let's let's just pull ourselves back. So how are you finding the Eurorack journey? That would be the question I should have asked an hour and a half ago. How, how is that? <laughs> how are you finding it? Uh, yeah, you know, it, it, it is... I, I didn't mean to do it. That's the <laughs> thing. So I just back back up a little bit. For yeah. years and years, people say, come on, gals, when are you going to get into Eurorack? I'm going, I'm not doing it because I've typically focused on infinity boxes and desktop units, you know, uh, for, in terms of reviews and I, iPad and iOS software and some desktop software. And I've kind of thought that was kind of enough. There's still too much to, to yeah. know. Uh, you know. I need to know Logic, Cubase, Studio One, Ableton, Reaper, uh, um, in you know, intimately, I need to know how all of those pieces of software works, and that that takes up such an enormous yeah. amount of my uh, my limited uh, mental capacity. So you know, Eurorack just was just too vast, and uh, and I've got a load of nice synths here that I've barely got the most out of. You know, mm. um, so I you know I've well catered for gear. I don't need any more gear. <laughs> so going into Eurorack was like oh it's a whole new category of gear you know yeah uh, so there's a bunch of reasons why I was kind of resistant I knew that it was uh I knew that it was going to be com you know compelling and interesting you know I, I was never in any doubt about that but anyway I the reason why I ended up getting into it was because um I was asked to speak at the audio developer conference last year which was a big thrill and an honor to be asked um uh, well to be part of a panel and um so i went down for that for a few days in london and um on the first night there was uh, i think it was like a big icebreaker event there was a quiz and um i was part of a team with uh, with a bunch of cool people including chris randall from audio damage and uh, tim exile oh endless yeah, tim yeah. exile 
uh, so I was part of that team. And these guys came over and kidnapped me from the team. They said, we want him. We're having him. And they, they were pulling me. They were tugging me away. I was going, oh, oh. And then, so I think, you know, um, I think Chris, I'm going, traitor. So these guys stole me from the team and they took me to the other team. But I thought, oh, well, I don't know why they want me because this room is full. This is like, oh, this is like the world's top audio developers <laughs> all descended from this conference, you know. There's a lot of very clever people in this room. Yeah. Um, you know, and I would probably put myself probably in the thickest category of people who were there, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And I don't mean that legitimately, you know, there's a lot of very smart people there. So, um, but anyway, we won the quiz. <laughs> we won the quiz. And they were all, all the team who I was meant to be in, all like, they're all like booing. <laughs> you know, traitor, boo, boo. But, um, but we got, the, the prizes were really fantastic. And, uh, you know, we got it to go. And um, the prize that I chose was the Mini Brute, Arturia Mini Brute 2. You know, right, it's a pretty, yeah. good, mm -hmm. pretty good quiz prize. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the Mini Brute 2 has got, a, you know, a, a large semi-modular aspect to it. Um, but, you know, I was looking at the Mini Brute 2 and I was looking at the little kind of attachments at the side that are there to attach the Rack Brute. I've always been a bit yeah. like that with if it's meant to have another if it's designed to go with something mm. I've got to have it you know that was a even nice, if I don't need that was it. a nice bit of design that was you know regardless of what the case saw, is about it's a nice way I of putting saw, those things together and I saw the bag the gig bag and I, and also the little legs that come out of the rack brute so when you close it you yeah. can keep it all patched and chuck it in this special designed bag and then, so that's what Rack Brute really, because I didn't intend to, but it was because I won that synth that I, um, yeah, that, that, that I got that rack. So, and I kept, and it was empty for, you know, a um, couple of months. I was resisting. I was just, I, I connected it and just had this big empty rack. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I also knew that once I started that it was, a slippery slope and yeah. i think a lot of people are you know having a bit of a laugh at me sliding down this slope really because you know i think um i've had some moments with it where the sound that has come out has been something so much more so much beyond what i could have anticipated i think and also it just starts doing stuff that i you know everything that you do on your iraq you've patched in so you are the creator of that sound yes. so there's a real sense of ownership of what you're doing and that's a yes. really huge appealing part of it but in that also it starts to do things outside of my perception of what it would be doing and mm. and oh, Oh, so I'm saying that a bit weird, but you know, it starts to do things that I can't. I, I know I've patched it together, but it's so awesome and brilliant and stimulating and interesting that it's just like, oh, I mean, uh, hopefully I've caught some of this on my show. And I'm, yeah, no, but, I think I think you have. I mean, there's this there's this sense that, um, as you say, you 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 own it because you are building it, but it's out of your control to a degree and you kind of kid yourself that you're in control and then it will just it will then explain it to you you'll sit you down and say look sonny you, it's not really anything to do with you you've just plugged some things in it's me that's making it work and you're so it's this dynamic yeah. with this machine where it's part you yeah. but it's just part stuff and it's, yeah it's fascinating yeah. it fascinating. is fascinating and you know some of the things i've got in my little rack here um like the sea devil. Oh, I've gone. There He's we gone. go again. Oh my god! That's how much time we're spending I doing know. this. That's that's impressive. <laughs> it is the endless conversation. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the the sea devils filter from Suit and Tie Guy, um, oh, yeah. STG Sound Labs, is um, it's an eighteen decibel uh, diode filter um, that's based on an EMS design, I think. Uh, very simple in that it's just got a response control, which, uh, sorry, frequency and response, which is EMS terms, I think, for 
resonance. Right. Still don't quite know why it's called response. But, um, uh, and then an, and then a modulator and an, an amount control. So very very simple. But I've been I was like putting stuff through it. Uh, I think the resonance was fully cranked, and and like sweeping um, from around seven o'clock up to around eleven o'clock on the cutoff knob kept doing glorious things yes and when i went past 12 o'clock and went that side of uh, from 12 o'clock through to around four o'clock it did utterly different glorious things and i don't quite know why it was doing a lot of what it was doing i, I had i think some audio rate modulation going into the amount control so there was a lot of i had quite a bit of patching going on um but just these lovely things mm. are happening. Uh, and wherever I put the control, those things were remarkably different. And But I couldn't really understand it in terms of, yeah, I, I know what's sort of going on, but I don't know why it's doing what it's doing. But, and I think this is the thing. There is something beautiful in the sound like a like a mm. beauty something beautiful in this weird sort of i don't know quite why it, you yeah. know if you see if you see some gorgeous like if you're out in a beautiful valley and you're looking down the valley and the rhododendrons are all out and you can see the waterfalls and it's and it's just beautiful you know it's like it's beautiful like that's beautiful it's all mm. quite i don't know why it's so beautiful but <laughs> well, i mean i think there's something you know, there's something about there's a purity about it somehow because it's not it's not washed and layered so greatly there's often a single thing or a couple of things going on it may be one waveform or it might be a twisted waveform which is giving it an edge of some of some kind but it's it's simple waveform something spinning there's yeah. a physicality yeah. to that there's a a connection to it somehow because it's not i mean it could well be a sample who knows but there's a sense that there's something very simple going on that's just that you resonate with somehow i yeah. mean it, it is unexplainable i mean i, I had a yeah, similar experience i think with the instruo filter uh the last um i did a a, a, a a patch thing last week i think it was and i pushed it into self-resonance which i don't do very often that's usually a mistake you know that happens when i drag it back but I'd let it happen, and it was just this lovely little sine wave that uh, the Turing machine was just tinkling with, and it just sat there and tinkled. And I thought, well, that's just awesome. You know, I would never would have made that, that up myself. I wouldn't, have done <laughs> right. it, yeah, I wouldn't have done it on purpose. It's yeah. just something that you you right. come across. Come across. Oh, yeah. Would you say that Instruo are the most sexiest pieces of equipment in the whole of the canon of music technology yeah i, I think they are getting that way it, i mean if only i could yeah. pronounce any of it that would make me happy but <laughs> right. yeah you know it's just, just lovely just, yeah beautiful design isn't it yeah. it's just really really lovely gosh but you see now and i know that i've arrived in the kind of euro rack world now in that uh, i am having gas for modules now i am yes. actually gassing about modules and that was the thing you, you know which i really didn't want to do but the morphogene has yeah. really interested me you know so that's sort of ooh. <laughs> um, but there's problem you know, solving as well i mean that's one of the things i don't think i've seen in anything else it's like playing guitar i'm not trying to solve a problem i've got a synth i'm not trying to solve a problem uh, you know but with you right, right. it's like I want to do, it's how do I do, but I want to do that with, I don't know, I've got to buy a module. Oh, I'll go off, go back, plug that in. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And that goes on, then it's a larger problem, and I'm trying to solve this problem, and so I'm going to need something else which goes in there. I don't know anything else which which quite does that, that sends me off buying yeah. weird utilities, because I think I just have to shift the CV a little bit this way, and then it'll all work. <laughs> you know, I keep That's at good. it. Yeah. But um, yeah, so what else have I, I mean, um, the Disting EX is also something that's like, oh, I think that is amazing because, you know. Uh, I love to that hate that thing. Have you got the EX on there? No, I've got the I've got the version four and that was a relatively early module because everyone said it can do anything. 
and so yeah. I, I got it and then I hated it and then I but every right. now and again you dig it out and go oh well I need I need a sample and hold right. it will do that I need well, a right. delay it will do that's that the, that's you the know. ultimate problem solved it is box, yeah isn't it? it is yeah yeah but the index just seems to do everything that you you know because it's got a really legible display on it um and but crucially i think what it does is something that i was really keen on um finding something which is uh it can play back i think eight voice multi samples right. and yes it comes right. with uh, a bunch of um spitfire audio multi samples sort of pre-installed on the sd card and um i think that's what i crave a lot of the time i'm i, I love polyphonic synths you know and yes. eurorack is not very polyphonic in its uh, in its nature um but to be able to sort of have something very beautiful like a like a multi-sampled harp or yes piano or something yeah a Rhodes, and a then, suitcase something like that a tinkly yeah, riders and, of the storm yes, like that. thing yeah <laughs> and, then, and then take that out and mess it through everything else yeah, you know i yeah, just yeah. kind of so that's that's kind of why I've been, um, you know, kind of hankering after one of those. And uh, I well, hope there's, there's another that... just just to throw an alternative in for the disting. I don't know oh, if yeah. that's an alternative as yet, but I that's my understanding mm -hmm. of it. Something called Droid from Matthias. Oh. I can't remember his name. It's the guy who invented the Symphonium. Do you know that? It's a big chunky oh. yeah, um, module. That, one as well. that looks good. That's all like yeah. kind of all about pitch sizing into different you know multi channels and scales and yeah yeah so crazy crazy stuff run your whole show with it but he's now brought out yeah. this new module system called droid i think and it is essentially right. a multi-functional cv generator that i think you program with pure data or something of that nature and you just mm -hmm. tell it what you want to do you program on a little text file i want you to do lfos or this or sequencing or this that and the other and you stuff it in and it does it but he's got Sort of a central brain and then you've got expanders for it to get more ins and out more cv out triggers out all this sort of thing and it runs off this beautifully designed little um glowing module matrix of leds and knobs and bits and pieces mm. and it can literally be anything and do anything and so he uses it to again run his whole show so his whole thing is running from these oh. things that he's programmed what to do and that's another sort of bridge between um yeah controlling stuff you'd naturally put a laptop in that mm. position to run ableton or something whereas this is mm -hmm. using the eurorack space to do that kind of thing and that's i Ooh, find okay. that very interesting, interesting. yeah yes um, somebody will know we're what speaking it's about <laughs> uh, we're just thinking about how beautiful the instrument is yes oh, oh i'm looking i remember seeing i think at super booth 2018 i think um a module that just made my eyes pop out of my head and made me want to get into modular just to have one and i think is it called the electrophon clang it's like a kind of chord generator yes is yes. the most beautiful module i think ever made it that is. One is the, that sort of I dial know. compass dial almost on the yeah. front that points yes yeah. yeah a lovely want, lovely bit of design I want again i yeah. want one of them just purely for the aesthetic of having one in the rack you know actually but actually what it does is really really cool as well actually um but um but again i, I I think this is something that is very, very compelling in the Eurorack world is just the, the, the a massive amount of um, innovation, but mm. also the fact that um, that these companies are small enough and are kind of light, light footed enough to be able to adapt uh, to trends and stuff a lot quicker than um, the big lumbering giants. Uh, an example being Roland, for instance, uh, they they make their own sort of cpu they make their own chips which is unusual for music technology companies i think maybe yamaha do as well but but roland make their own uh chips and uh, they put an enormous amount of r d and expense into making these chips and typically what happens is that um that like say for instance when the supernatural chip was developed um i say chip it's all whatever it is you know how the it's but it is bespoke silicon that they're making rather than using uh you know like most other companies who source things they make these chips and they kind of go right okay so in the first three years just only the absolute top of the range stuff will have this in there 
And then at about the three year point, they bring out, so like you can think they did it, I think with the Jupiter 80, it was the first supernatural. Right. Um, yeah. And they brought out the Jupiter 50 a couple of years later, which had that. Or maybe it was, a, I'm not sure, maybe it was a year later or something, perhaps in that case, but, but it was still their more high end stuff. And then at the midpoint, maybe sort of three or four years in, they bring out the kind of mid range stuff has it. And then about seven years in, then the budget stuff gets it. But when the budget stuff gets it, that's when they launch the new one, uh, you know, the new chipset. Mm. So that's in all of it, you know, which I guess is probably fairly standard corporate kind of process i suppose but the reason why i'm I'm mentioning this it means that roland have to kind of (laughs) well this explains i think why roland sometimes seem out of touch it's because they've made a decision sort of 10 years ago or something of where they're going to be now you know and they're having to sort of make a bunch of assessments trying to think about where music's going to be going and those kind of things to to, to set themselves mm-hmm. on this path but once they're on that path it's too expensive and too they're too invested in that in that pro in that production process to be able to respond fast yeah. whereas in like you're a rack you know you can have like you know they could you know a, a brand new product could be out in three months after it was conceived as an idea or you know it's yeah no written. absolutely I mean I think that I think that's very interesting about about Roland and that's there but that's what they've been used to they've been able to do that because that's what's driven things and Korg yeah. work the same way Yamaha work the same way and it was interesting reading the the CEO of Roland was talking about the Xenology thing uh, recently, the Zen core that's in your MC seven oh seven, and Actually, yeah, yeah, and they have the they have big ideas and they know what they're doing and they this is what they want to do, and they're yeah. not really interested in what other people want them to do, particularly because they have their own plan and they well we did all of that you know they I know you want us to release another one oh one and this and that and. Uh, Jupiter mm. 8 but we we did that all we've done it and we've stuck mm. it on a chip for you and you can you can run it on your computer you know whatever that's fine we're moving on with this thing that's our plan and I wonder how how long they can keep that up because you're yeah. right everything else around them is moving so far so innovatively and the the level of frustration I think that people have for these larger companies is going to get to a crisis point I think perhaps I don't know. I mean, we, we, we always yeah. blow ourselves up as if we're really, really important when actually they probably sell far more of everything to the Japanese home yeah. keyboard market. You know, that's well, where all the money is. Um, yeah. We all think that we're so influential. Well, I said, well, you know, we kind of have a little bit of a snigger when 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 Roland launched their V accordion range. You know, it's like, whoa. <laughs> but then the accordion market, you know, that revolutionized the accordion market and it, probably yeah. the accordion I don't know. It, it may be worth more money than the entire Eurorack market, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Wait, wonder how much brass, you know, Yamaha sells. How much do they do in right. brass a year? Because you know, so. ah, that's the thing, isn't it? With Yamaha, this blows my mind with Yamaha. <laughs> Yamaha make every single instrument that you can think of, you know, orchestral instruments, band instruments, you know, synthesizer instruments, and they make pretty much the cheapest, most budget, or, you know, of versions of all of those but they also make all the mid-range stuff and they make yeah. all the high-end stuff yeah. as well grand pianos that, as well yeah you know you know high-end you know really top top stuff and the bot you know there's no company like uh you know yamaha dwarf roland don't they you know i mean yamaha makes sports bras air conditioning <laughs> units jet skis you know they, they, you know <laughs> they, 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 but they still keep the three tuning forks as their logo. They do, they do. Always... Well, I have a I have a <laughs> microwave by uh, one particular uh, DJ orientated music tech company. Funnily enough, my microwave is by Akai, which blows ah, my mind. Yes. I, I was in the market for a, for a microwave. I found yes. for some reason I stumbled across one that was made by Akai. Right, I'm having that not, one. It's not an Akai Pro. Not, not an Akai Pro. Pro. No, but the AK is... Pro microwaves. The AK Pro microwaves. You can tell the difference because they've got the MPC livery, you know, and um, yeah, and they've got the and... dr- belt belt drive as opposed to uh, <laughs> <laughs> whatever yeah. it is that I've got. It's the same logo. 
It's yeah, just... no, but I mean, Akai, they, 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 they sold off Akai Professional, didn't they? I think around probably about 20, 20 years ago or something, 25 years ago. Yeah. Um, so in music. In music, that's right. It was yeah. New, New Mark, I think. New Mark bought up. Uh, that's Amesis Amesis as well. and M Audio as well, isn't it? And, and audio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, audio is a funny back... thing. Did you did you know MIDI Man back yeah. in the day? Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. Who was it? Mike Partridge, wasn't it? A MIDI Man? Because yeah. weren't they like a, a Scottish big... company that made MIDI interfaces, and and then they became this huge thing, and then they got sold off and became something else. It's like a strange. They were for a while in the early two thousands, as they became M Audio, they were the most adapting mm. of all the companies the emerging home computer you know being able to find the right price point and the right yeah. products things like the oxygen 8 you know usb controller keyboard you know when nothing was usb uh, britain had its uh, evolution which was kind of like not quite as good uh, but uh, who did they who did evolution become but evolution were uh a quirky company in the nineties, weren't they? Making uh, well, they were controllers, weren't they? Uh, um, and then M Audio, though they just at one point they became didn't they become the biggest company or the biggest turnover in music technology? I think at some point Maybe. in we, we would sell uh, shed loads of Delta Ten Tens, and I mean Delta I had a Delta, I had a Delta Forty Four with an Omni IO box, which was the best yeah. invention there was nothing i couldn't replace it for years it took me years right. to replace it eventually yeah. it had to yeah. go because i didn't no longer had pci slots you know it was, it was one of those yeah. occasions yeah right. otherwise i'd still yeah. be running it yeah but they kind of but then i don't know what happened and they okay. seem to sort of just sort of stumble a little bit i'm not sure or they got but actually no i think what it was was and it, and it connects to our earlier conversation that uh dj culture had got so yeah. big. New Mark, New Mark was like everyone wanted, everyone wanted Technics, but ended up having to have you know could only afford New Mark. I think, yeah, yeah. I think New Mark got a lot of uh, a lot of tr a lot of trade by you know undercutting sort of Technics. I think, uh, but I think New New Mark became such an enormous company. I I, I don't think people saw that come in. You know because. Mm because it, it, it was rocketing in that you know i was talking about that divide between music technology and uh dj culture but newmark wow you know so much so i mean like elisis really you know are a legendary company you know i think yes. in many ways people forget about the impact of things like the um the you know the microverb or or, or the midi verb or you know the, mm. you know uh um, dm5 but also, drum sound yeah the dm5 but and also the sr the HR16 and then the SR16. The SR16, yeah. which you can still buy, which is, I th oh, maybe you can't. Oh, no, I think there's a new version of it. But uh, but, it, but the SR16 was on the market, as was the DM5, yeah. for an extraordinary length of time for a music technology product. Mm. And for I it had not the to performance have any... pad. I had the, the drum pad thing uh, for not that long ago, and that had DM5 sounds in it, pretty sure. That's what it was. Right. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I think uh, I, I think that the the mighty Andromeda, uh, I think the, an, the mighty Andromeda, uh, kind of nobbled Elisis in many ways, you know, which yeah. was uh, you know an astonishing synthesizer, really. With uh, well, no, actually, what did it for it for Elisis? And I've got one in front of me here. Is the Fusion, the Elisis Fusion, you know, which which promised well. That was almost like uh, the new Mark <laughs> equivalent of the Korg Oasis, you know. Um, just yeah, like uh, it was, you know. This, it's like this one in front of me, eighty-eight keys weighted. It's got physical modeling. It's got FM. It's got analog uh, modeling, and it's also got sample and synthesis. You know, so it's like a rompler. No, well, and, and it's a full sampler. It's got eight audio inputs you can multi-track eight and it's hard drive built into it came out in around what 2004 2005 wow. and you know the spec oh was it 256 note polyphonic um because they'd had a hit with the ion which then begat the the micron 
uh, and which was a very good virtual analog. And actually, the the Ion is a cracking little synth. Actually, the um, the Micron sounded good. Was hampered somewhat by its uh, the controls. Improved a lot when it kind of got reborn as the Akai Miniac. Same synth, different <laughs> sort of game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, but th- that uh, that analog modeling engine was expanded upon inside the the fusion um so even if the fusion was just that engine with with the controls it would be something but you know physical modeling i mean very few hardware physical Mm. models i mean the uh yamaha started the trend didn't they with a vl1 back in the 90s um but physical modeling you know very you know cpu intensive and uh but also when you play around with physical modeling, it's not very much fun. When you mess with the parameters of physical modeling, you, you lose it really well, quick, don't you? you know. Yeah, you can kind of go, well, okay, I can see why they've, you know, why these patches. Uh, I borrowed a VL1. It's a beautiful thing. Do you remember what that looked like? The Yamaha yeah. VL1. It's got like weird, like wood wooden paneling, sort of isn't it? Walnut. Yeah, it's it's going on. very plush. And yeah, the quality, yeah. everything top notch on it. Um, but, you know, I was like thinking, oh, wow, I can imagine, you know, because I'm kind of thinking about adjusting parameters or adjusting controls like you would on on, a, on an analog synth. But when you do it on, it just starts to sound a bit broken and not very good. Yeah. So then you yeah. just, you know, so it's... Because so like, well, you, want... you can bow a piano. So it's, but why would I want to do that? <laughs> 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 or you can blow but, into yeah. a guitar. Yeah, but that sounds weird. Not in a good way. I, yeah and but uh, yeah yeah it's just sort of yeah you know just uh but also the fm synth in the fusion is pretty huge um so so it's kind of like uh but it feels but what happened with the fusion is it really needed to reach uh like a 2.0 um firmware you know it, it needed it was it wasn't really the OS is clunky and some of the shortcut functions never work properly. In fact, there's an eSATA port on the back of it. I mean, how often do you see that wow. on a synthesizer? But I mean, but it had to but compete that... with computers. I mean, that was the also the problem right. at that time. You, you would have to be extraordinary because yeah. you were competing with the infinite yeah, that's right. CPU, that's right. you know. I, yeah. I mean, phew. yeah. I mean, laptops were just kicking off then, really. You know, we'd, in, in terms of being a viable... Um, uh, you know, the MacBook Pro and things like that mm. were really kind of become viable music making machines. I was just going to say about the eSATA though, Paul, and just, just finishing off briefly about the yeah. Fusion, is that eSATA port never, ever worked. It never got connected. It was always something that was just there for future, future proofing it. Future-proofing, but yeah. sadly, all the future proofing side of it never came to pass because in a way the Fusion was crucified by... Um, people who'd never actually seen it or um online you know it got it got it got it got a lot of bad bad publicity and alesis i think didn't you know they really it came out the screen is ugly as sin on it and when it came out the phantoms were just coming out with color touch screens Right. And this is yeah. like this kind of weird blue, ugliest screen, you know, and the, it just looks a bit, you know, I don't know what the, the the resolution of it is, but it's, you know, it certainly didn't look nice. So when you'd go into your music shops and see a fusion alongside a Phantom, or um, I don't know if the if it was the um, motifs, I don't know if they were out then right. yet, but but whatever the amp power equivalent was, it just didn't quite like it. Didn't it didn't quite have it, but 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 crucially, the the the, the sounds that 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 they had in it just weren't were just really uninspiring you know you'd play the roland patches you know roland always had very very good patches from you know from a sort of um from you know like a bit of a wow factor to them or something but you know it just didn't sound that great um now my friend the dear departed steve stephen howell who was hollow son he he died a few years ago sudden and shocking when he died but he he really uh he did a lot of good for the fusion by um releasing a load of um 
a load of uh, free expansions for it. I think he was working in, yeah, he was working with them. Um, he, he worked for Akai actually as well, but, uh, but he, he did a lot of, uh, um, com- a lot of vintage instrument, um, a lot of really good versions of in, um, vintage instruments, like the RMI electro piano, for instance. You know, that's something you don't see. You know that. You know that one. No, that's particularly. like what Tony Banks used a lot of on the uh, sort of mid seventies Genesis. It's a piano. Uh, it was like a tour. You know, it was a. It doesn't sound very piano-y really, but it was. Uh, you know, um, Tony Banks. Um, I think, like, if you think about stuff off Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, a lot of that kind of you know, the piano ish thing is one is the RMI. So the fusion gained a load of really cool vintage uh, sounds that was um, that that really put it into a different category to a lot of mm. the other stuff that was going on. Uh, sadly, a bit too late, and I think the damage had been done. And I think they'd plowed a lot of money into it. And I think at the time, I think Elisis were heavily in debt. And I think this was when they got sold. They, 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 I think it was when the company got bought, I think. Right. And I think the, so the casualty then, the Fusion, never got its, uh, it never got its uh, full development that it should have. Um, but in NAM uh, this year, I met, um, oh gosh, I can't remember his name. He's, he's a super cool guy. He's the guy behind Wave Razor, the software. Oh yes, you know yeah, Mock, uh, M O K. Um, God darn it! Yeah, I know who you mean. <laughs> uh, he was the fusion was his baby. Oh really? So That's yeah, I think he. I mean, it's really interesting yeah. how um, sound design is so important. It's not important in Eurorack at all. Um, I mean, in mm-hmm. in terms of developing presets for your product. To show it off oh, yeah. well enough yeah. because it is yeah. you know you, you go into a music shop and you press a couple of buttons you just want a big huge sound you want to be impressed that first moment you know and that must be a, a big thing mm. I, mean, I remember at, at turnkey funnily enough the sound designer from elisis came along i i don't know if that was actually his his role but he was a guy who wrote a whole load of the presets for the at the time it was the qs6 i think it was he had with him oh, yeah. to demo yeah and it was phenomenal. I mean, the QS6 was a keyboard that sat over there that nobody looked at because it wasn't particularly interesting to look at, particularly. And yeah. uh, But he turned it on, picked a couple of patches, and just blew us all away because he knew what he was doing and he designed those sounds to do a particular thing and he absolutely right. nailed it. And that's so important. Yeah. It's, it, but the problem is, I find, uh, again, is that it's become a bit of a cliche. I mean, every new software synth, every new synthesizer comes out with the same, not the same bunch of people, but it looks like the same bunch of sound designers. It's Richard Devine, it's Lardy Dar, and this person and that person have all designed presets for it. And it's like, yeah, really? I mean, they must do everybody's because it's always this this group of crack producers who produce these sound sets. Yeah. But it is really important. Yeah. It's just it's just become a bit of a a bit of an eye roll i think these days yeah but you know you gotta have it you gotta have it and it might as well be somebody famous i suppose yeah yeah uh it's i mean it's curious i think um how well like like you mentioned earlier you know oh another soft synths come out another soft synths come out and uh and just where is the such you know where is the market saturation point mm. um and it feels possibly that music software has kind of you know like how many more compressors do you need or how many more you know you, when you've got these things you know so it becomes like a quite a hard sell for the marketing department to uh yeah you know, to find something um, interesting it's different with synth guys yeah. though i find i mean being just hanging out on facebook groups um the synthesizer ones a new synth comes out and they all buy it you know just like that yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then a couple of weeks yeah. later there's pictures of oh, I've just put the the hydrosynth there's a hydrosynth in that I'll put the argonate on top you know and there's another yeah. dozen oh. of people who have done that and I sit there going wow <laughs> they just I they just buy what... another one <laughs> but, uh, we are spoiled aren't we? Yeah. you know like 10 years oh, right so that was something we were talking about before we went on air um, I've been uh, I've been doing stuff oh there I go oh he's gone <laughs> Oh my god! We've this is an epic conversation. Be- yeah, we've got to be done before the next one happens, right? That's our that's our goal. 
markers. That's like, those are half hour markers. Um, oh, <laughs> uh, the, um, the, like, so I've been doing stuff on Sonic State for 10 years. Oh, so yeah, I, yeah. my first was in June, 2010. And, uh, and it's been a wonderful thing to be part of on Sonic State. But I mean, you know, in, in terms of Sonic State's life, that's, uh, you know, Sonic State's been around since 95 that's online. In fact, yeah. So, you know, well, actually, and they said that they had a news group that was live at 93 when the World Wide Web first launched. So they really yeah. were there from the beginning. So I guess I'm still, you know, I'm still very much a newbie, really, in Sonic State, sort of, uh, in, the, in the Sonic State history. Uh, but I mentioned this because... Um, because the 10 years that I've been involved in Sonic State, I can kind of look back over those 10 years and just like look at what's happened um, because of just my own my own journey with Sonic and the, the things that we've been reviewing and the, um, you know, and the, the, the things that we've been, that we've been partial to, you know, things that we've seen or all, all, all along the journey now. And it is, utterly remarkable just how much i mean specifically the synthesizer world has yeah. uh blown up in enormously and uh you know Eurorack has done it you know the the, the Eurorack thing you know back in the 90s you know i remember my mm. first experience of dope and Eurorack yeah, yeah. Just dope for what, really, you know i don't know when I don't know when the first company other than Dope for manufactured something in the Eurorack module uh, format. Did you go to, to Music a, Mesa and stuff like that at that sort of time? Did you see the Superbooth before Superbooth? No, I never. I've, ne I've not been to Mesa. I never. I've never went there. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I mean, I think I think it's something in the mid two thousands, isn't it, when Eurorack really, you know. In, other companies started to kind of yeah. make things. Uh, but anyway, what I was going to say, though, one of the most significant products uh, in the last, I would even say last 20 years, but certainly last 15 years, is the little Korg Monotron, just that little 30 quid little yeah. analog device. And that changed everything. I think that, that little device there, there's a, that's the kind of that's the moment in time that thing there coming out everything happens post that that changes everything that is oh, the transformation because that, the that led directly to the volkers didn't it that's that's what gave birth led, to the little box because uh, i had did. a mono tribe um yeah the one in between there which was great yeah, yeah. i enjoyed it mm. i had to sell it on eventually but i at that time <laughs> but uh, yeah <laughs> great no i can i can see exactly what you mean um, well, because what it did, it, it, it meant, oh, so analog electronics is viable. You yes. can make them again. Or yeah. that it is something that can happen again. You know, I've been, you know, because analog was super expensive. I mean, there were some small companies like MFB, um, you know, making some little analog synths and some others or whatever. But it was kind of not mainstream or, you know, mainstream within a, within the music technology way uh but the the monotron just went oh okay and they, they must have sold them in the bucket load those yeah. you know um but you can see it and actually the volker is another enormously important thing but just in terms of uh the way things evolved from mm. the monotron uh but also i think it probably it was the gateway drug for people as well it was their first piece of hardware for a lot of people because yeah, yeah. for 10 years or so, computers had just become yeah. utterly the dominant thing. Yes. And a lot of people have just had a laptop and maybe a controller keyboard and an audio interface and that's what, and, and some monitors and that's what their music technology was, you know. And then and they this was also probably monitor. just before the phone became you know a viable music yeah. thing so there was a space of time where hardware could remind us yeah you know, before we got lost into our phones so it, it found its it space oh, found its it space found its brilliantly. space brilliantly. it did but then i just think you know a lot of people then went when volca came out it was like oh, okay you know that's so but you know started yeah. getting that and started and then a lot of people will have branched off then into Eurorack at that point or you know but I, I think that 
the monotron, as I say, I think is yeah, it's so you know for something so cheap and something almost so disposable, it's just such a vital product yeah. in, in the evolution of stuff. Really, but, but it's so fun. It's so fun to have a little drum machine. Uh, you know, the, it's different to fun with a computer. I've got, I've got a thousand drum machines, a thousand drum sounds. I can sit here all day trying to find a decent snare sound, or I can just you know hit a couple of buttons and I'm making a little beat. And that's fun. Yeah. And then I'm making a little bass line and that's fun also. And I'm having a nice time, you know, and that's music. Yeah. It, it kind of, yeah. it, it somehow meshes the DJ thing in as well, hmm. because it's, uh, I imagine uh, not being a particularly a DJ, uh, that DJs probably got a bit bored with the whole thing. The twin decks and stuff, you can only go so far, perhaps yeah. as a musical yeah. instrument. And so, yeah, <laughs> being able to mesh in little boxes yeah that start making mm. noises that you can play with alongside. I think that it, it was a bit of a bridge, maybe. A bit of a bridge, you know? Someone said something quite interesting to me. They said, oh, you know, in the halls of residence, you know, student student accommodation, they would, the guy who would have the pair of SL1200s, yeah. you know, 20 years ago, is the guy now. He's got his Euro rack now. It's like, oh, that's yeah. an interesting sort of, you know, a bit of a... Uh, um, so you do see it. There's an enormous uptake of Yodorak with younger people, uh, mm. which I think is really interesting. I think, um, I guess, the the point of entry, you, I guess the biggest expense is getting your case to get yeah. going. Um, but once you're, once you're in there... Um, it, you know, modules, especially like dope for modules, are super affordable, aren't they? I mean, that's, you know, compared yeah. to maybe, uh, yeah, you can get, you know, they're very functional. Uh, they're really great, I think, dope for stuff. I think it's so, it's, it's, you know, there's a certain quality that you get from dope for, I think, that you that you can rely on. Um, yeah. Uh, and <laughs> just thinking about uh, just thinking about a joke I played on Nick at Superbooth. I, I was just trying to decide if it's uh, is it appropriate? I'm allowed. I don't think it is. Well, it might be because it was a joke. Um, oh dear. Um, oh, go on then. I, but I'm, this sounds like I, I don't actually do this particular drug really. So it was that's on. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I came into the back room and said to Nick, oh, no, I don't know if I could say this. <laughs> Tell me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm probably better not, actually. Um, oh, sorry, okay. sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, what a horrible tease. There we go. Yes. Anyone who sees out and about has got an excuse to come up and uh, yeah. ask me. What, but, but you could, what, you, I mean, what, all right, so, to move on, you could talk about the pricing of Eurac, perhaps, and how... Yeah, how clever! But you know, the way that it works is that it's just it's expensive, of course, and no doubt saying it's expensive, but it's also achievable one module at a time. You know, you're not spending That's two it. grand on a, you're not spending That's five it. grand on a Moog yeah. One or something like that. You're spending 150 quid here, yeah. 200 quid there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then you see, it does add up, doesn't it? It has that. I, I, yeah. I was you know, everyone is going, use modular grid, you numpty. Get on modular grid. Modular grid's, modular, modular grid's amazing, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, they start using modular grids. And then go, oh, God, it is really, but it's really good. But it tells you, doesn't it, it how tells much. You the price. You know, it tells you the price of your model. <laughs> I know. And I was like, oh, God, oh. okay. Um, but also then just seeing how much people have spent on their, on their rigs and just thinking, holy yeah. cow. Yeah. I mean, you know, like when the when the Moog One was launched, it was like, "What? That's a ridiculous yes. cost." But then you can see how people's racks easily surpass that in in, yeah. in, in price, and it's like, "Whoo!" Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I, I must admit, I, I I do, and it's just an horrible thing to say this in a way, but I do think that things are a little bit overpriced in or can be overpriced in Eurorack. And I do also understand that for smaller manufacturers, there's no way that they mm. can afford to do it. You know, I don't think that, you know, I don't think people are trying to make their millions in, in no. it. Um, but 
I think, and this is why I'm saying it's a horrible point. I love all of that and I really support it, but you can see how like a, you know, like a, like a predatory company like Behringer can just kind of go, oh, okay, you know, and, and the modules that they're putting out now are just incredible, aren't they? They're the system 100 modules, but mm-hmm. you look at the price of the, the 55 modules that Behringer are doing and they're around four, you know, between like 40 quid and 60 quid and, you know, maybe 90 quid for the most expensive one. Um, and the new 2500 modules that they've just announced look fantastic and mm-hmm. uh, so it's like but whoa what <laughs> i would say on all of that though I, i've maintained this uh, yeah. opinion on their on their modular all the way so far it, it just it bakes my noodle for some reason is that i i get it and all that but when you talk about um kids younger people getting into Eurorack why on earth would they buy a system 100 what does that mean to them it's some kind of ancient piece of technology that has right. the wrong sort of writing on it Good. it's the wrong sort of format i mean when they talk about the moog stuff you've got s trig and v trig and you go what is that about because in in euro yeah. has come on since yeah. those days and we've actually developed better ways of doing things better standards better naming conventions and so yeah. although someone who desperately wants a system 100 or a system 55 or whatever it is can now have one relatively cheaply i think that's a much smaller mm. market than if behringer says we're going to release a bunch of really interesting colorful no, no. crazy oh. modules for 50 quid no. they would well they would nail it with that that's, that's what dreadbox did with their chromatic range though didn't they yeah, they made yeah. Range of very colourful and funky, interesting modules. Yeah, so um, that's in, that's more interesting to me than than what they yeah. are doing. I mean, I would love sure, yeah. I would love a system that's great, but I don't mm-hmm. see how any of their current modules, these modules they're releasing, can fit into my rack into what I'm doing. Okay. It seems to be a clash between really old technologies really? that don't seem to make a lot of sense. So I'm sort of, you know, I don't think they've nailed it. <laughs> I've got well, I've got a question for the chat room really because I don't know this. I was something I was going to do was if you how much does it cost in Behringer modules to put together a system fifty five hmm. with the same amount of modules that's oh, in the reissued gone. system? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my light's turned off. That means that, that my light lasts about two oh. hours and it's gone. See, now oh. I wrote about this, so I'm, I'm going to try and look it up because I uh, wrote for it. Ah, okay. Well. Yeah. Uh, because the system 55 what was it 35 grand or something when oh, what, you know, originally the, no 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 when 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 moog did the reissue of the system 55 it was you know you know mega mega bucks mega 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 bucks now i know i know that this is in you know system 55 in your you know the behringer one is a euro rack version um but yeah i just don't i mean it's quite in i think i thought it was around the kind less than a grand you know i thought it was sort of somewhere around a 700 sort of quid mark um maybe we need yeah. to pl- plug um, it into modular grid maybe would be the uh yeah the answer. someone might well have done modular grid hence me uh trying to tap into the chat room so um, what did i say 41 quid each some of those bloody bloody blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah. I didn't give a total, did I? See, so, yeah, no, I'm gonna have to sit here and add it up. No, that's not gonna do me any good. But I've got buy it now from Toman all written all over the, all over the page now. So, so one of those. Rick, so that's, Rick, Al- Rick Alpin saying around a thousand dollars. No, sorry, yeah. it was like a thousand quid. Uh, yeah, about a thousand dollars or so. Oh, for the Roland 100. Yeah, you can do a system 100 for around a thousand. Yeah, about a grand each. That's. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but i mean i would love those cabinets i mean we're talking about something like the model 15 i mean th- those yeah. the ones that we saw stroma yeah. use at uh um at toman last year yeah they got that that got that system was it i can't remember the model 15 out i think it was uh you know three big cabinets of fantastic mode modular mm. i mean that's a it's it's a it's a physicality it's a it's a intrusion yeah. into our space of something awesome yeah, yeah, yeah. which i don't think you can capture perhaps in little eurac modules you know there's a there is a difference size, between these things like jacks all yeah. size jacks you know they're quite nice um okay here's a little here's a little question eurac related then um 
How many cables does one need? There's no limit to that. <laughs> <laughs> I've no. got a lot, but I never seem to. I never seem to have enough, and I've only no, got a little, little, a little. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, so. no, there doesn't have to be into that. There's all sorts of lengths you can get as well. I mean, I had to get a whole new load when I double widthed my Eurorack case because mm -hmm. this this one wouldn't reach to that one. So it's like, oh, a whole other yeah. load of cables. You know, now, these little extras who, you keep forgetting about. Yeah. I want to get those. I know Nick had some, and I can't. I don't know if this you can still buy them, but they were these cables that had little um, LED lights in them. So if you put yeah. like a, a it, it, they will kind of flash with. Yeah, the, Div Div has got a few of those. The yeah. only caution retail is that they do shave off. Um, they do take amps out, that's so uh, you know you have a little drop perhaps in in CV. Yeah. So that's a that's a thing. I suppose so my pitch might be a little pitch might be a little flat then if, if yeah. you use it that's possible okay. but it's not going to be a trouble on mm. a LFO or, or something like that I shouldn't think you, no. you know we should probably I, force yeah. ourselves into bringing it to a close I think so too <laughs> I, my, my belly I haven't eaten I haven't eaten since uh, 12 o'clock the ah. midday so my belly my belly's been uh, has been groaning Growling. rumbling away uh, growling. <laughs> um, I've got two new additions in my household as well. Um, got two kittens, two oh. little kittens. They are just unbelievably cute. And, uh, you know, um, I just, uh, like, yesterday, I sat and watched them for two hours just putting on the funniest show I've ever seen. <laughs> They're <laughs> They're amazing. Uh, so I'm, yeah, they're like eight, well, I think about eight weeks old and they're just, uh, they're just super cute. And oh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling the need to go and, uh, to go and give, squidge yeah. them a little bit. So are, are you going anywhere this <laughs> um, summer? Are you going to, are you getting out of, out of the house at all? Um, I am going to do a little bit of camping. Uh, a new hobby I've got, which I started last year is um, paddle boarding. Which I am really we're, into. We're flipping twins, is what we are. I'm, I'm camping and paddleboarding this summer. <laughs> oh God, it's, it's amazing! It's the that's greatest amazing. thing. Oh, that's it's brilliant. incredible. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, because uh, I was brought up with canoes or kayaks. You know, the canoes where you're, too, yeah. you're doing this. Yeah. And I hated it. Mm -hmm. I'd drown. It would kill me. I'd just. Oh. But you know, we had to do it as kids. Yeah. And but I liked being yeah. out on the water. I just didn't like the drowning bit. And paddle boards. Mm -hmm. I'm out on the water. I'm not going to drown because I'm not. I'm not fixed in it. I'm not tied into the bloody thing. I can just get off it's if great. I want to. And, Neil, and it's lovely. And Neil, like, yeah, yeah, it's lovely. I've just, been oh, serious nice. joy, serious joy. Yeah, I've got a big. Uh, it's, I've got a big um, bell tent as well, which is uh, which is so good. It's, it, it feels very ostentatious when we when we set we set it up at festivals. You know, it's like yeah. what's it? It's six meters across. It's huge. Oh, it's a really big one. You know, you could probably sleep. 20 people in there um so if <laughs> lord of the manor when we when we take it to festivals but um going uh going camping with that on the paddle board and um yeah that's gonna yeah, be that's awesome. something I'm, I'm kind of hoping that there's gonna be a little bit of summer left uh, <laughs> um but can i just say i've been following the chat room and it's brilliant it's just such a it, so awesome in there well you know just the Cool, you know what a great yeah. bunch of people there thank they're you. a lovely no. bunch we, we've largely ignored them we're sorry about that i mean we would take questions if we if we could be bothered but we're we're yeah you know, we're all right we're talking it's, it's yeah. only easy when we Here start we drying up <laughs> yeah and it can't it, it doesn't dry up it just doesn't dry up but um okay uh i think yes i think the kittens and my belly are kind yeah. of collaborating um to make me cool. want to uh well, let, let me just finish off by saying, well, first of all, thank you so much for, for being on here, Gaz. That's been an absolute joy and a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, we'll have to do it again, yeah, I think. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> uh, and I will just yeah. say that uh, coming up next week, I have Anna Matronova from Modular Moon um, here. Uh, Tolpa Dolsha, she's also known as. Uh, I'll be chatting next Thursday night, all being well. So do look out for the link I'll be sending around for that. That's mm. next week. That's all I've got planned, I think. 
But then we'll mm. be hitting we'll be hitting the end of the month, the molten monthly, and our li- usual sort of live stream, and then probably a bit of a summer break. Who knows? Who knows? I can't stay away. That's the uh, problem. Big big shout out to 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 the to the very cool Jim Newman there in the chat room with his uh, with his. Uh, you know, literate, intelligent uh, commenting is uh, always a pleasure to see. Um, oh well, I thought we did really well. We got, we got a few hours in there without... A, did very well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, mate. Well, I love you and leave you and, and let you go. And thanks ever so much for watching, everybody. And uh, we'll, we'll be seeing you My soon. Pleasure. I'll try to find the button. Yay. There's a button here somewhere. So, yeah. See you later. Yeah.